Fire District Board of Directors regular meeting to order. And uh, roll call shows that we're all here. And I would like to ask everybody if you would please silence your cell phones. I've already silenced mine. I'm usually the worst offender. So I'm the first one to comply. I would also like to remind uh, everybody here that the district will be video recording the entirety of the board meeting. So right now, if everybody would please stand for the flag salute. And uh, Council Member Marquez, would you lead us in the flag salute? Sure. My, my pr privilege, sir. Thank you. Um, ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And please remain standing for our uh, invocation with uh, <coughs> Chaplain Keith Robbie. Please bow your heads with me. Loving and gracious God, you are indeed the giver of all good gifts, and we thank you today for all your blessings. As we gather tonight at this meeting, we ask that you will be in our midst. Help us to make decisions that will be pleasing to you. I thank you, Father, for those we recognize tonight for their dedication and years of service to our organization. I pray for our firefighters, administrators, and chiefs that you would continue to protect and watch over them. We pray for those that are sick or injured, for your strength and comfort and healing on them. We ask that you continue to bless and watch over our families for the sacrifices that they've had to make that we may serve our communities. I pray tonight for our board of directors, Lord, that you would give them the wisdom to continue to use the resources that you have provided wisely. Give them unity of thought that they may continue to enhance and to grow our fire district for the good of all those that have placed their trust and confidence in their leadership. All glory be to you, loving God, now and always through Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 Please be seated. This time I'd like to ask our clerk of the board, do we have any changes to the agenda? Um, yes, we have one change. Um, staff would like to request to move an item under new business, item number 12, to the beginning of new business. Okay, and I'm going to have to ask you to tell me that again because I couldn't Oh, hear yes, it. we'd like to request to have item number 12, overview of workers' compensation. We'd like to have that item move to the beginning of new business. So okay. before item number nine. So we're just moving the order. We're, the okay. to are, the we, are we going to move it up to before seven? Uh, oh, yes. Sorry, okay. yes, so before it, seven. Okay. okay. Change is noted. Thank you. Thank you. Presentations and announcements. Um, first item is GFOA CAFRA um, award presentation. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Stephanie Reimer from Monta Vista Water District to present the award. And I'd also like to invite President DeMonico and Finance Director Steve Heidi to the front to receive the award. President DeMonico and members of the Chino Valley Fire District Board of Directors, good evening. I am Stephanie Reimer from the Monta Vista Water District in Montclair. It is my pleasure to be here with you this evening to present a Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting to the Chino Valley Fire District for the Fiscal Year 2018 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. The certificate is issued by the Government Finance Officers Association. GFOA is a major professional association serving the needs of more than 20,000 appointed, elected, local, state, and provincial level government officials and other finance professionals throughout the United States and Canada. It provides top quality publications, training programs, services, and products designed to enhance the skills and performance of those responsible for government finance policy and management. The Certificate of Achievement is the highest form of recognition in governmental accounting and financial reporting. And its attainment represents a significant accomplishment. We hope that your example will continue to encourage others in their efforts to achieve and maintain an appropriate standard of excellence in financial reporting. 
Your CAFR has been judged by an impartial panel to meet the high standards of the program, which, dem which includes demonstrating a constructive spirit of full disclosure to clearly communicate the fire district's financial story and motivate potential users and user groups to read the CAFR. President DeMonico, on behalf of the Government Finance Officers Association, I'd like to present this Certificate of Achievement and Excellence in Financial Reporting to the Chino Valley Fire District for your comprehensive annual financial report for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2018. Congratulations. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Just want to make a couple of comments that uh, our finance department and, and, and Steve Heidi, our finance managers, work really hard in bringing us to the level where we are today with our finances, our budgeting, our reporting, and it's really an honor to receive this award because uh, this is really, really significant, and uh, I, I just can't even imagine uh, how significant it is. I mean, it's 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 big. And thank you so much because we really appreciate it. And Stephen, thank you so much and your staff you, and, and everybody that's done anything. And we'd like to say a couple of words on Well, I think you said it very well. Uh, thank you to Stephanie for uh, representing GFOA today. And thank you to the board for their support and encouragement in us achieving that high standard. Uh, we have a small finance department, so this type of effort, rigorous effort that's required is not to be uh, discounted in any way, uh, particularly for smaller organizations to meet these standards. And so we, uh, we appreciate the receipt of the award. We believe it is sort of a blue chip stamp of approval on our financial reporting and the transparency efforts that we undertake, ultimately for the benefit of our community. Thank you. Let's take a picture. <coughs> Next item, Chaplain Service Award, Robert Lewis, Jr., Five-Year Service Award. Please come forward. years of service. We're looking for about 25 more. <laughs> God willing. <laughs> God willing. God willing. <laughs> Thank you so much. And we really appreciate everything you do. You. And a lot of it goes unrecognized. A lot of people don't really know what you do and when you do it. And a lot of times we don't even know what and when you do it. We know you do do it and we appreciate it. And it's, it I know. And, and, you know. and no matter what time of day or night, it could be Three o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the afternoon, and you get the call. Thank you very much. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Chaplain, I truly appreciate what you do for our community and our organization. Uh, for those of you that don't know this fine gentleman, he has an incredible background. Sit down and talk to him at some point. He has had a very interesting life and done a variety of, of things, accomplished some wonderful things uh, in addition to the service that you provide to our community through this program. So I appreciate it. And also, I truly enjoy your voice. Um, those nights that I can't sleep, I wish you could just come and stand in front of the bed and talk. It's so soothing. You, you have that presence about you. I, I really appreciate what you do. Thank you so much. And I have Deputy Chief Collins. Up. As he oversees the chaplain program, I wanted him to come up Thank uh, tonight. And I promise I'll be nice to you. So Chaplain Lewis, he's been great to have in the program. Uh, he's a very quiet individual. Uh, kind of almost demure in some ways, and yet he's he's a he definitely is a rascal. So he has a very he has a very uh, dry sense of humor, and he'll catch you sometimes just flat-footed. And he's great to have around. Thank you for your service. You've been a great addition to the program. You serve the people here well, and the people in the community well. I just want to say thank you for your service. Thank you.
Employee Service Award. Kara Colonna, please come forward. 15 year service award. Now have your 15th year, uh, 15 year service award. You've only been here a little bit longer than me. So uh, we kind of started at the same time. But anyhow, thank you for your 15 years. We're looking for 15 or 20 more, just like the Chaplain Lewis. Uh, I'm not going to let you out the door fast. But thank you for all your hard work, your dedication, and everything that you do. Thank you. So I'd like to present you with your most appreciated team. Thank you. Kyle, it's my honor to present you with your 15 year pen. Congratulations. Thank you for your service. Your future here is very bright, and I look forward to seeing the great things from you. All right. Thanks, Chief. Thank you. Appreciate it. We have two additional service awards on our agenda um, this evening. Captain Pete Morales, 25 years, and engineer Jeff Titula, 25 years. However, um, they will be rec we're not able to join us this evening and will join us at a future meeting. Public communications? Public communications? Public communications. Um, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to go for... Uh, after the uh, presentations, or do we begin? Would you like to take a break? Now we'll do public communications first, and then we'll take a quick break for if uh, anybody would like to leave okay. after the presentations, and then photo opportunity as well. So let's go ahead and. Public communications. This is a time and place for the general public to address the board of directors about subjects that do not appear elsewhere on the agenda. The public may address items on the agenda at the time addressed by the board. Due to board policy and Brown Act requirements, action may not be taken on any issue not on the agenda. When you address the board, please come up to the podium, state your name and address prior to making your remarks. Please limit your comments to five minutes. And do we have any requests to speak? Please come forward. My, uh, my name is Charles Antuna, uh, and I am a uh, homeowner, retired homeowner in Chino Hills. And I'm not sure if I'm doing this right. I'm not sure if this is on the item, on the agenda. I didn't quite get a chance to review it. But it's regarding the Star Fire. So may I speak about that one? Um, you could speak. Would you like him to speak? Now we do have that item on the agenda, so you can speak at the time of that agenda item. Um, Usually public communications is reserved for items that are not on the agenda. I'm sorry. Take your time. I will wait till later on in the agenda. Thank you. Are there any other requests to speak on any item not on the agenda? He does. Members of the board, Steve Eli. 22-year resident of Chino Hills. Um, real briefly, I just wanted to thank your uh, staff, uh, chief, and your fire marshals for incredible communication um, that continues daily, monthly, weekly. I've made several uh, quick requests. Uh, for example, brush that was near near my home, and uh, the fire marshals jumped on it right away. Um, uh, the communication has been stellar throughout, and uh, I really do appreciate it. And uh, as an elected official, I don't expect to get extra special help, um, but I have noted that they do that for everybody, and they treat everybody equally, and you have an amazing staff. Uh, you have an amazing leader in the chief, and I appreciate all your leadership representing our community. Thanks. Thank you. Do we have any additional requests to speak? See none. Liaison reports. Suzette Dang, San Bernardino County, Fourth District. Good evening, members of the board. 
staff and audience members. Suzette Dang with County Supervisor Kurt Hagman's office. I do have one, an one announcement. We have a shredding event coming up right here in Chino. It's going to be on Saturday, October 26th, between 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. It will be at the parking lot of C at Chino City Hall. Address is 13220 Central Avenue. Um, we do recommend that you limit the documents within the five document size boxes. Um, we did have a, quite a few um, cars and folks show up last shredding event, and we hope to have a lot more. So save the date and come save all your documents and come see us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Council Member Mark Lucio, City of Chino. Okay. Um, Council Member Brian Joe, City of Chino Hills. Um, Council Member Marquez. Sure. Good evening, everybody. Uh, first of all, I'm not really going to talk about the Star Fire, but uh, um, being a council member, and I've lived in Chino Hills now for about 35 years, um, I am so proud of this organization. Once again, I just want to say thank you, management, city staff, for doing such a wonderful job uh, the last fire that we had. But it's, it's expected. You guys just do a tremendous job. And I just want to say, as a retired fireman, I'm very proud of you also. And uh, just keep up the good work. So thank you. Um, Charlie Blank, Fire Safe Council, do you have anything for us? No, thank you. Okay. Anyone from the school district? Okay. Seeing then, uh, no I think additional. what we'll do is we'll go ahead and, and move forward and we'll take the break after the Star Fire report. Okay. So we'll take a break after that and then we'll resume the meeting. So right now we'll move on to consent calendar. And uh, I'd like to ask the board if anybody would like to pull anything from the consent calendar for discussion. Number three, please. Number three. like to ask anybody from the public, would anybody from the public like to pull anything from the consent calendar for discussion? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board and I'll ask for a motion to approve the consent calendar in its entirety with the exception of item number three. So moved. Second. Have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes 5-0. Item three, Director Krieger. Uh, this is for our uh, director of finance. Um, just something that caught my eye was a very large payment to CalPERS this month, uh, $2.9 I know that's not a monthly obligation. Uh, can you explain why it was so large at one time? Yes, yeah, so uh, we have annual obligations to the California Public Employers Retirement System, and uh, CalPERS does offer... Uh, a discount which approximates about 3% of our obligation for prepaying that amount at the beginning of the fiscal year, which would be July in this case, directly ap applicable to your observation there of that large amount. And so while 3% in some regard may seem modest in relation to our ability to earn returns, which are limited by the government code on our investment dollars, 3% uh, is a good trade-off for prepaying that obligation. And I'm thankful that we're in a position where we're able to cash flow that and make that happen without impacting the ongoing operations of the district, yet creating additional value through savings for the taxpayers ultimately. Excellent. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, with that, I move that we uh, accept this. Yeah. Okay, I'll no, second it. I have a motion in a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes 5-0. Okay. Old business, none. New business. Starfire overview, item number seven. Did we move an item up? Okay. We're going to take item number 12 at this time. And that is overview of workers' compensation. Purposes for the board directors to receive information about workers' compensation. Report by Fire Chief Tim Shackelford. President Monaco, members of the board, good evening. On Sunday, August 4th, I received an email from Director Williams with a request to place this item on the agenda. Uh, let me read my recommendation. It is recommended that the board of directors receive and file this information provided in the report. Uh, in a moment, our human resources director is going to provide an overview, uh, but before she does that, uh, legal counsel has some information regarding this item. 
Uh, uh, President DeMonico and members of the board, uh, after this was uh, requested to be agendized by board member Williams, uh, district staff was notified by our third party administrator that a workers' compensation appeals hearing is scheduled for tomorrow morning uh, regarding Mr. or board member Williams' uh, case. And so I would encourage the board to not uh, discuss that particular case, but instead keep this discussion to a, a general overview of the workers' compensation uh, appeal process. Um, and our third party administrator notified us that notice of that hearing went out August 1st. Thank you. Can I make a comment? Not right now. We're doing our staff report. Okay. All right. Good evening, President DeMonico and members of the board. Based on the request for a general overview of the workers' comp process, I have prepared the following information to share with the board. It is the policy of the district to provide workers' compensation benefits and assistance to all employees who incur work-related injuries or illnesses. This is straight from the district's policy in Lexapol. Employees receive all applicable benefits within the California Labor Code. It is the responsibility of the employee to inform their supervisor of any injury or illness. The employee and the supervisor complete the required paperwork and the employee is sent to the district's occupational medicine provider for treatment. Human Resources receives all related paperwork and processes the claim through the district's TPA, or third party administrator, excuse me, York Risk Services who then conducts their own review of the incident and initiates and remains in communication with the employee throughout the claims process. York, our third party administrator, is responsible for authorization of treatment, therapy, medications, etc. York sets a realistic estimate of future liability, a projection, for each claim which reflects the probable cost of compensation and medical treatment that can be reasonably expected over the life of the claim. The district is self-insured and liable for all costs incurred up to a $250,000 special deductible program through SDRMA, the district's liability insurer. Any claim that exceeds that $250,000 threshold is paid out by SDRMA. The Workers' Comp Program follows the California Department of Industrial Relations Office of Self-Insurance Plans reserve requirements for each claim. Coincidentally, the final phase of a two-part Workers' Comp training for our suppression personnel will be complete next week. That concludes my general overview of the workers' compensation process, and I may, if I can answer any questions. Okay, well, at this time, I'd like to request any public comment on this item. Seeing none, I'll bring it back for any board comment. Mr. Williams? Well, I, do, I do have some things. Uh, first off, I'd like to make sure that people understand that this has nothing personal to do with me. We have several people that are uh, off right now on workers' comp, and uh, I see that we are self-insured, and I'm wanting to know how our liability and so on goes with uh, being self-insured and the other question I have is, does the department have any input whatsoever as far as a person's uh, treatment and that type of thing? Um, in other words, uh, does, a, does the department have input to say, well, we think they should be treated or we don't think they should be treated? None whatsoever. No, that is between the doctor. So that's, that's a medical opinion and our third party administrator and the insurer. The district does not get involved in that. Director okay, Williams. and um, that, that was one thing that I was kind of curious about is if the district got involved in any type of uh, statements as far as a medical treatment, oh, well, we think this is a workers' comp issue or no. it's not a workers' comp issue or that no, type sir. of thing. That goes through the process. The <coughs> district district just moves it through that process, which essentially is coordinating the paperwork and any documents that they re may request from the district related to the, the actual event or incident that occurred. But no, not, not on the treatment. That's all based on a medical opinion. Okay. I just uh, So the district doesn't have any input whatsoever in regards <clears throat> to treatment or anything like that after it's 
gone through its process and and so on. Um, no. Okay, I just want to make sure of that. Um, so all these guys that are off now on various disabilities and stuff, seems like we've got quite a few right now, and uh, I just, uh, that's all handled by York, is that correct? Correct. Okay. And each person can go up to $250,000, so the district is actually paying, uh, could pay $200,000 on five or six people, and, and it'd be substantial, and it'd never go into the um, SDRMA fund. That is it's correct. It's only one incident. Per occurrence. That goes over $250,000 when SDRMA steps in and says, okay, now we'll give some uh, coverage or help on that. That is correct. That's correct? Okay. That, that's, that's all I was wondering. Uh, I didn't know if SDRMA uh, had anything to do with it because it was my understanding that SDRMA didn't have anything to do with workers' comp whatsoever. No, uh, they do work together because they are the insurers, so they do work together, but being that New York is the third-party administrator, they are the ones that are reviewing and, and providing the authorizations. They, they conduct what's called utilization review. That's all done by York, and it's the oversight is by SDRMA on that. Okay, I, I really appreciate that because I didn't know how, how that worked being uh, self-insured uh, if the district you know, took it forever, or if there was some at point that SDRMA or somebody stepped in there or something like that, because it seems like some of those could uh, really get high. They can. Uh, and uh, that's, that's what I was kind of curious about as far as what the uh, self-insured issue was involved mm -hmm. with. So um, I think that pretty well answers my questions. Uh, I don't think there's any other questions, but I just wanted to make sure that people understood that it had nothing to do with my situation and uh, there was nothing to be talked about. John? I believe, it's, I believe that's it. Uh, any other board members have any comments, questions? Thank you for the overview of it. You're welcome. President Tomatico, would you mind if I just provided a little bit of insight into what Director Williams was speaking about, I think that would, to sure. put staff at ease and perhaps the public some information with that. Uh, so back on July 24th, I sent Director uh, Williams an email uh, outlining some current topics that I've been discussing with board members, one of them related to the number of vacancies we have. We currently have some vacancies, and then we do have, at the time of the email, we had five personnel that were out with significant injuries. I want to clarify for our staff and the public that there's no personal information related, related to any medical issues. It's general information. The purpose of sharing that information with the board is really twofold. One, that there is a potential future uh, fiscal impact, uh, but in addition to that, in a little more pressing, we may, I anticipate seeing some challenges where we're going to have to force hire some employees for staffing uh, if we do have increased fire activity either regionally or throughout the state when we have units out of the area. And then the final piece of that was looking towards the recruitment that we just opened up, uh, that the numbers are growing and we're going to be recruiting a larger pool of firefighter paramedic candidates. So that was the purpose, the background behind the email that was sent to Director Williams. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chief. And uh, Christy, thank you so much for, for a great report. And this doesn't require a motion. We'll just receive and file. Well, the fact that I mentioned the fact that there was quite a few guys on workers' comp, uh, that, that's not in violation of anybody's privacy or anything, is it? Okay, great. Thank you. I believe as long as you don't mention names and injuries and that type of thing. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to our attorney for that. We're good. Okay. Okay, item number seven. <laughs> Starfire Overview. Purposes for the Board of Directors to receive an overview on the Starfire in the City of Chino Hills. Report by Fire Chief Tim Shackelford. That, that was my birthday. Are those my candles? <laughs> oh. <laughs> President Monaco, members of the board, staff, and members of the public, good evening. Uh, I'm going to try to take you through a, a presentation here of the Starfire. 
Um, a couple acknowledgements on the front end of this. Uh, in the fire service, we tend to t speak in acronyms quite a bit. So if, if I use some terminology that you're not familiar with, please let me know and I'll try to clarify that. Um, there's a number of photos that we have in here. Some of those were shared with us with our PIO. We're not sure who the source was, so I can't give credit to that person. And then finally, uh, for both the board and the public, if you have specific questions related to the slide that I'm covering, please get my attention. I'll try to address it at that point. And then when I conclude, we can go a little deeper if it's things that aren't addressed in the presentation. So on July 28th, 2019, uh, we experienced a very significant fire here in Chino Hills. Uh, initial time of dispatch, this is the information getting through to comm center. Uh, this is in military time. So 13, 17, and 26 seconds was the initial dispatch to a vegetation fire in the area of Chino Hills Parkway and Falling Star. And I know the board's going to have a tough time seeing that on the back here. Uh, but I'm going to focus my attention on the screen on the front for the public tonight. Uh, at the time, the weather conditions, uh, 97 degrees. Relative humidity was about 40%. Uh, and we had some winds west from 16 miles an hour that actually increased uh, later on into the incident. Uh, this is a picture, a, a Google Maps picture. And obviously, uh, the, it's not green. Uh, this was taken some time ago, but I'm not sure what the date was, but clearly not uh, any time in the last few months. Um, and obviously, the vegetation is much taller than this. But I included this to give you perspective. This is approximately where the command post was located, and that's the initial area uh, where units were dispatched to as well. Uh, this was our initial response. Uh, five engines, water tender, paramedic squad, and the battalion chief. Uh, that's over half of our organization on the initial dispatch. And shortly after the first engine arrived on scene, uh, they quickly added two additional engines, uh, essentially all seven fire engines that we have covering 80 square miles uh, and the population of about 175,000 uh, in the Chino Valley area were committed on this incident along with the water tender, battalion chief, and, and there's some additional engines that will come in uh, later on here. So our partner ag agency response, we had a very robust initial response from our partner agencies. CAL FIRE had a, vol a full vegetation response with aircraft. Los Angeles County, a full vegetation response with aircraft. Los Angeles County Fire alone is 24 pieces of equipment on their initial assignment for a vegetation response. We also had a response from Orange County Fire Authority. Uh, so these agencies responded uh, under some agreements, cooperative agreements that we have. A lot of this is through SOLAR, which is the acronym for San Bernardino, Orange, Los Angeles, Riverside County. And that came about after the freeway fire in 2008. And that's the, the cooperative method that we uh, interact with our partner agencies uh, on wildland incidents. So uh, on this initial assignment, just with Chino Valley Fire and the three agencies noted there, uh, in excess of 50 pieces of equipment uh, dispatched to the scene pretty quickly. Uh, so 1320, so about three minutes later, a caller reports uh, to dispatch that the fire is now about 500 yards away from his home on Monteverde. Uh, Medic Engine 66 arrives on scene at 1326.30. Now keep in mind for, the, for members of the public, that may seem like a, a long response time there. Um, it's actually not. There's generally about a 90 second call processing, which is the national average for call processing. And then our personnel have to don the appropriate level of protective equipment. Uh, and they have, uh, our standard is 90 seconds, 90% of the time. Especially for a wild lead incident, it's a little more involved. They wear different boots and some different protective equipment. So uh, just from the beginning of that piece there, you may have in excess of three minutes or very close to three minutes before that unit's actually on the road, depending on where they're coming from. Uh, so in 66 arrives on scene, and the initial report's about an acre in light to medium fuel uh, spreading to the east with an immediate structure threat on Monte Verde. Uh, he, the captain quickly requests two additional CVFD engines, so now we have uh, all seven engines committed on this incident, in addition to the water tender, battalion chief, and a paramedic squad. Uh, the fire quickly triples in size uh, as, as he's standing there uh, giving out assignments and determining priorities, uh, and then it transitions to BDU, which is the CAL FIRE dispatch center, that's San Bernardino, that's the acronym, becomes the UOP, and that's the Unified Ordering Point. Uh, and that's important in that they handle all the ROS input requests for equipment. Uh, so they transition from a, uh, normally it's a dispatch center. Uh, that's what we work with normally through the comm center. BDU is a command center. So they actually have uniformed staff working in the center that can make some decisions in terms of incident priority, 
uh, and handle some things a little differently than most dispatch centers. So they, they become the unified ordering point for all the resources assigned to that incident, and that's for a coordination uh, purpose. So at that point, our, our battalion chief is talking a little bit to comm center still, primarily to CAL FIRE uh, San Bernardino. So this is a video of the CAL FIRE crew uh, arriving at the scene on the initial response. So you can see the, the uh, substantial fire activity that's occurring. Uh, obviously, it's, at this point, it's beyond three acres. Uh, noting the direction and the, the size and, and shape of the smoke column there, uh, there is some wind pushing this fire. So we continue with the incident timeline. Uh, 1339-37, it's not a critical piece of this, but a level one notification is sent out from Comm Center, and again, keep in mind that the Battalion Chief is coordinating with CAL FIRE, BDU, and Comm Center uh, at this point. So the level one notification goes out. That's more of an internal thing for our chief officers, notifying them that uh, incident command has been established, that we have an incident commander and we have working incident uh, within the district. Uh, about that same time, the B Duty Battalion Chief makes a request to increase water pressure in the area, uh, knowing that uh, we are gonna tap the system uh, in a significant basis. And then a, a short time later, fires uh, quickly at about 30 acres. Uh, this is me arriving. This is, so keep in mind, this was a Sunday afternoon. Uh, so our normal overhead staff that we have here working in 40-hour assignments is not here. Um, I responded from, from home here in Chino Hills, uh, along with uh, Chief Williams, and you'll see him noted later in the incident. But that's about the time that I got the command post. I couldn't get out on the radio. There was quite a bit of radio traffic um, to not notify uh, dispatch of that piece. And at that point, I was briefed by our incident commander uh, that we had about 140 homes threatened uh, with, by the fire, and that was pretty quick into the incident. Uh, this is a, a shot that I took uh, from right after I arrived at the command post just to give you an idea of the, the size of the fire, and you can see one of the fixed-wing aircraft that's dropping FOS check on the, on the flank of the fire there. Uh, and that's just to show you what it looked like at that point. Um, so it continues... Uh, we now have a report of uh, grass and trees on fire of Montserrat, and that's at 1355. 1357, Comm Center gets notified of a report of a house on fire at Miramonte. So I want you to just pay attention to the time frames here of how quickly these calls are going in, and keep in mind that these are going to Comm Center and being relayed to CAL FIRE or directly to our battalion chief uh, in the midst of the radio traffic. Uh, about a minute or so later, another caller on Montserrat. The caller on Montserrat can see fire personnel and attempting to flag them down. Uh, we get fire personnel on scene of that incident on Montserrat. Uh, now we get a report at 1401 of a roof fire uh, on Miramonte, which actually is an attic fire. And this is a, a picture of one of our crews. Uh, the road you can see is Chino Avenue behind them, and they're looking at the back. But uh, obviously, you can see the significant fire threat. Um, to the residents there. Uh, the incident continues on here. So we now at 14.03, so in the course of about seven and a half or eight minutes, the incident commander, uh, in addition to coordinating all these resources, is getting bombarded with this information. So this call had gone to Ontario Dispatch, so not even Comm Center, not our, this isn't our primary dispatch center. Uh, we have a reporting party uh, stating that a resident in that area called her daughter and the fire's close to her house and she's unable to get out. Uh, so this quickly becomes a priority for us. Obviously, uh, life before property and some resources are shifted that direction to try to address that issue. Uh, we now have the resident of the structure fire on Miramonte. Uh, they're in communication with dispatch, their advice to make sure that everyone's evacuated. Uh, Medic Engine 65 arrives on scene uh, of a very large, uh, about a 6,400 square foot, two-story single family residence, and they find a, a well-involved attic fire at that point with some significant wind behind it. Uh, battalion 1614, that's uh, Battalion Chief Williams. Um, he is added to this incident. He, like myself, was off duty, uh, became aware through uh, the notification process, has changed into his uniform, his protective equipment is now responding from his residence in Chino Hills, and he responds to the structure fire in Miramonte to uh, be the incident commander of that portion of the incident for us. Uh, just to give you some perspective, uh, this is the map here of the general area. Um, I know the board won't be able to see this, but the public will. So this is the general vicinity of where the incident command post was. 
but you can see the number of homes that are potentially threatened from the fire um, as it grew. Uh, obviously, this is not a current map. This is an older one, the vegetation is green, but I wanted to use that view to show you how many homes uh, were in that vicinity and, and what the crews were uh, addressing at the time. And again, uh, this one with the map is the actual structure uh, that was destroyed, unfortunately. And one of the key points I want to make with this is, and you can see some of the elevation in this with the topography, uh, a beautiful home, beautiful location, incredible view. Uh, from a wildland fire perspective, um, a, a poor placement uh, in, in terms of trying to protect this property. It's at the top of a chimney, and it really pulls the fire up quickly uh, towards that residence. Uh, this is a, a, again, I'm not sure who the photographer was. We were sent these photographs uh, fairly early on after our crews arrived. Uh, you can see the fire is well established in the attic space. It's already breached the roof. And if you look at the top, uh, the gable here, uh, gable, then you can see fire well involved in the attic, and it's, it's burned through. Uh, another view of the same thing. And one thing of significance to note here, um, take a look at the flags. They're going straight out here. There's a, a significant wind pushing this fire through the attic of this home. I note, note the smoke, that the smoke's laying down as well. Sorry, let me get caught up with my slides here. Again, this is uh, on the street where the structure burned, and these are some of the additional resources that came from neighboring agencies. Also keep in mind that as all this is being coordinated, the normal routine type calls that we face day to day are still happening in the background. Uh, this is where we're fortunate we have our paramedic squads that were uh, running those calls. But those calls, the chest pain calls, cardiac arrest, fall victims are still occurring uh, throughout the district while this incident's going on. Uh, the fire is well advanced here. It's uh, clearly breached through the roof. Uh, well involved, and, and one important thing I want to note from this picture, if you can see uh, that this crew here, they're changing their gear. This is one of the requirements uh, that our personnel face. Um, if you can look in the background here, this gentleman is in wildland PPE, so it's a thinner, single layer uh, type of Nomex material where this is structure fire turnouts. Prior to anyone making entry into a burning structure, it's an OSHA requirement that you have full protective equipment on, meaning these turnouts, uh, SEBA, and unless there is a imminent life threat, meaning someone's trapped in that structure or we have a reasonable expectation that there is, they're not allowed to enter that structure until we have a standby team in place. Uh, so essentially the, the point of sharing that is it takes a lot of resources on scene prior to being able uh, to put personnel operating inside a structure fire. Uh, this is a very large residence, as I mentioned before, about 6,400 square feet, about three times the size of most homes that we uh, encounter fires in. Um, a attic fire, especially in a large two-story home, very difficult to fight, very labor-intensive. You need a lot of resources quickly uh, to get in with hose lines and hand tools, and you literally have to start pulling the drywall ceiling down to access the seat of the fire to get ahead of it. That's the wind you're hearing in the background. About 14, 13 hours, uh, Battalion Chief 1614, Battalion Chief Williams arrives on scene and is uh, handling resource accountability, determining incident priorities based on what's happening there. Um, he recognizes that they need some additional units for structure protection, that there's other structures threatened, uh, especially with the embers that are being produced from that home that's burning. Uh, around a few minutes later, nine to 10 minutes later, 
Uh, the fire is now rapidly approaching Chino Avenue, uh, which is problematic for us. And uh, I was actually en route from the command post to the structure fire to see if I could assist Chief Williams. Uh, and I was stopped by our captain uh, from Medic Engine 61 with the water tender uh, because there was a threat of, he, he perceived and I agreed with him that there was a potential that the fire could cross Chino Avenue. And I want to show you an additional slide here. Um, so this is Chino Avenue. So the perspective has shifted. Um, at that time, if you can see the pointer, right where it says Chino Avenue, is, the fire was, was back here further. Uh, but crews were set up along Chino Avenue, and there's a, a picture that I'll show you momentarily. Uh, the concern was if it were to cross Chino Avenue, if you can look at the terrain, the fuel, and obviously the number of homes in this area, uh, we could have had very significant issues and lost a number of homes had that fire crossed Chino Avenue, especially with the wind pushing. So this is the firing operation that occurred along Chino Avenue. So that firing operation was designed, our crews actually uh, used flares, went out into the brush and started that fire about 20 to 30 feet from the road. And the purpose of that is to burn off some of that fuel to create a buffer between the street, uh, the fire front as it's going to approach, but more importantly, the other side of Chino Avenue. Put as much space as possible between the fire that's gonna come with some intensity uh, to help prevent it from spreading. Uh, you can see the flame lengths. I'm not the best photographer and I want to be clear, I was, it was parked, I was not moving uh, or anything else when I shot that video uh, and I'm not a very good photographer as well, but I wanted to be able to share that with you to show you what was going on, some of the tactics and all the moving parts of this incident and constantly rearranging incident priorities uh, to try to protect as many homes as possible. Uh, so this is the Orange County helicopter coming in and actually taking some of the heat out of that firing operation to help keep the embers down. So again, one of our firefighters uh, went out into the brush with a fusee, a flare, and set this backfire along. So the helicopter actually came along to take some of the heat out of it, but you can see the flame length that we have there. Uh, and again, this one demonstrates a little bit better of the topography across the street of Chino Avenue, how steep those hills are, and the fuel load there. And it, we had a, a very substantial... Uh, threat if the fire crossed that. Um, you do see some fire resources on the street. Uh, this is our water tender. There's an engine. It's great, but uh, those two pieces of equipment, three people total. Uh, that water tender responds in tandem. Uh, this is my vehicle parked here. Uh, the only water that I carry is in an ice chest, and that was to give our, our uh, crews drinks. This is not a firefighting vehicle, and we have a CAL FIRE unit here. And then this is an Ontario Battalion Chief that responded in with some additional, re additional resources to help us. Very limited resources along here to try to hold this fire and keep it in check from crossing Chino Avenue. Uh, incident timeline continues. The incident commander uh, requests five additional Type 1 engines. Uh, and at this point, we have really leaned on our neighboring agencies pretty hard for resources uh, because we have units that have responded to the incident to assist. We've also requested coverage for some of our stations because we don't have a single piece of equipment left that has a pump on it uh, if we have another fire somewhere in the district. So in conjunction with that resource shift to the incident, we have also requested units to come in and cover some stations for us. Uh, while that is occurring, we also have some communication, and in this case it was Deputy Chief Collins. He had backup duty chief coverage that day. Uh, he was coordinating recall of off-duty personnel. Uh, and I'll get to that momentarily, what he was able to do with that. Uh, about 1548, we had a request for two ambulances. We had three firefighters that were injured, uh, all of them relatively minor uh, bee stings. And then around 7 o'clock, the forward progress of the fire is uh, essentially stopped, uh, but work continued on for several days in the area. Uh, so over 200 firefighters on the ground at the peak of fire activity, four helicopters, four air tankers, and uh, two dozers, and in that 200 firefighters, there's a number of hand crews as well. Uh, continuing at 156 acres burn, one 6,400 square foot residence was completely destroyed. Three firefighters injured. Uh, the cause is determined to be a, a bird that contacted wires, caught fire, and fell to the brush below. Uh, we, I've had some folks tell me that they see birds on wires all the time. Um, how did this happen? Uh, you can touch one wire without a problem. It's when you touch two, you create that circuit. Uh, that bird did. Uh, they actually found a deceased bird with a hole burned through it from the electrocution at the area of origin with the fire. 
uh, mop up, which is fire service term just for the really going and, and cooling of all the hotspots uh, and stopping the threat continued through August 1st. Uh, and containment, I know we had some questions on this. So containment, that's the status of wildfire suppression uh, signifying a control line has been completed around that that's going to stop the fire spread. So just because we stopped the forward progress of the fire doesn't mean it's been completely contained. And the concern is you still have fuel that's burning. You have unburned fuel on the other side of that line, especially if it's a wet line created by hose. You have to put some barriers in place. Typically, that's a hand crew or mechanized equipment. A bulldozer coming through and putting uh, dirt, basically removing any unburned fuel out of the area. Uh, it got into some oak trees, extensive work with the hand crews over the course of the next several days in there as well. Uh, the total suppression costs are estimated about $450,000. The CAL FIRE piece alone was in excess of $300,000. Uh, the part that is a very positive piece of this for us and created some relief for me once I arrived at the command post, that fire is entirely in the contract area that we have our service contract with CAL FIRE, uh, which translates to they show up with their checkbook and they're financially responsible for that, which is of great benefit to us, and that's the reason that we have the contract. Uh, we're not a large agency. We have seven stations, 110 firefighters total, 34 people on duty every day. We don't have the resources to have helicopters, bulldozers, uh, fixed-wing aircraft, things like that. We, we just don't have those resources available to us. And Chief, real quick, the cooperative agencies that came in, Ontario, Rancho Cucamonga Fire, San Bernardino County Fire, whoever came in, that's just part of the mutual aid agreements that we have with everybody. We, we assist them, they assist us in, in a time of need, correct? Yes, sir. That's all part of the Master Mutual Aid, uh, and that's throughout the state. Uh, there's some things, once it goes beyond time periods and things like that, that there is some payment, uh, but especially on a local level, very cooperative. Typically, it's the 12-hour mark uh, where that transitions to a, a fee for those services. Uh, but we provide those resources. We do that on a regular basis to our neighbors, uh, knowing that we are not large enough to handle an incident of this size and scope on our own. And um, we, you know, we rely on their assistance, much like we provide assistance to them as well. If you remember the large recycling fire that Ontario had uh, several months ago, we had uh, a few engines at that as well. So we had our district there, we had the, the majority of our uh, organization, there are seven engines, that's all of our fire engines. Our water tender, battalion chief, the truck, and one paramedic squad. Uh, so at the height of the activity, that is, uh, with the exception of three additional paramedic squads, so six people, all of our on-duty resources were committed to this incident. Uh, we backfilled three engines, and that's what Chief Collins took care of. So we were able to recall uh, personnel from off-duty, uh, have them travel in, and staff three additional engines. Uh, five chief officers came in off-duty. Uh, investigator, our, our community liaison officer, auxiliary worker, uh, and I neglected, I, I believe it didn't make it up on the pop-up, our PIO uh, also responded and, and handled a lot of the media inquiries. A uh, very robust response from Cal Fire, Los Angeles County Fire, uh, Orange County, Ontario, Montclair, San Bernardino County Fire, Rialto Fire, Colton Fire, AMR, Chino's Police Department, Public Works, Southern California Edison. Uh, a lot of entities involved in this. Uh, and I know uh, some of the folks in our community are not fans of Edison. Um, I do have to give uh, applause to them. Um, they showed up in force, uh, and they showed up promptly. And we had, uh, I'd estimate, 15 to 20 Edison personnel at the command post uh, within the first two hours, very concerned about the cause of the fire, uh, willing to provide whatever assistance necessary, and we're out actually working to restore uh, services pretty quickly. And it was, it was impressive. Also, the gas company. Uh, as well. So before I get to questions, a, a couple takeaways that I mentioned at the council meeting last night, uh, mainly for the residents about preparation, um, concerns about attic vents and things like that. Uh, we have some information available through the Ready, Set, Go program that's available on our website. We have some brochures from that. The other piece of this, we had some concerns and some issues with the public of people that did not live in that area uh, that were curious, and I understand that, but driving in the area, uh, that impedes our response, slows us down, and it creates some safety issues for our folks. Uh, you can see by the conditions, things are rapidly changing. We have personnel operating in the street, pulling hose. They're focused on the fire, protecting life and property, and they shouldn't have to watch for people driving. Uh, as I made my way around the incident, there were three different occasions I actually had to stop and honk at people because they were driving, 
and they had their phone out and were videoed and had crossed over onto the other side of the road where I was either stopped or, or trying to move along. Additionally, we had a number of folks that were actually standing in the brush uh, in areas taking pictures. And again, I know they're curious. Uh, conditions change rapidly, very dangerous location. As I mentioned at the council meeting last night, in the wildland arena, that's called fuel for a reason. You're, stand, you're essentially standing in fuel. Uh, please don't do that, don't put yourself at risk. With that, I can open it up to questions. Okay, well, this time I would like to request any public comments. So, would anybody from the public like to ask questions or speak? My name is Charles Antuna. Uh, thank you for uh, taking my comment. I appreciate that to the board and to the fire chief and the deputy chiefs. Uh, I'm here to extend my personal and deep appreciation to our firefighters and other first responders that battled the Star Fire, to the personnel and leadership of the Chino Valley Fire District, and the many supporting debar departments that quickly responded to the scene with great speed. It was a remarkable <coughs> sight. Obviously, we owe a debt of gratitude to our brave first responders who selfishly put themselves in harm's way to help us. It is important to remember all the good our nation's first responders do every day and support them in every way possible. They are truly our heroes. Uh, just a comment and uh, maybe a concern. Uh, Chief Shackelford said in part to one news organization uh, that uh, they did not run out of water when there are 20 fire engines hooked up to the fire hydrants and almost every street in the neighborhood had residents out with garden hoses, there's going to be a decrease in water pressure. I would like to support any measure that would <coughs> enhance fire's ability to expedite water pressure via on an on-scene type of procedure or other utility or city resource in order to further eliminate any water uh, pressure delay. On a side note, also, uh, I want to uh, make a note that uh, is there any way we can increase or in put in place a pre preventative uh, or wider uh, fire barrier between open fields and our homes uh, up in, the, in that area. Again, thank you for listening. Absolutely. Sir, thank you for your comments. I could address some of those questions, and if I forget any of those things, please remind me to, to circle back on it. Uh, specifically on the water issue, um, it's a, a system issue. Uh, it, absolutely nothing is wrong with the system. The system functioned as designed. Um, it's essentially a capacity issue. Uh, and without overcomplicating it, uh, again, my comments, uh, when you have that many engines pulling that much water off the system, you are going to see a decrease in pressure. Um, I think a, a simpler way for me to explain that, and, and I'm hoping that this makes sense to folks in my head it does, um, we'll see if it translates well. Um, envision your home and you're taking a shower and someone decides to start the dishwasher. Uh, they put a load of laundry in the washing machine at the same time, turn the sprinklers on, Another shower goes on and every toilet in the house flushes at the same time. What happens to that shower? The pressure, one, you may get scalded depending on what's happening there, but the pressure drops dramatically. Um, and it's not an issue that your system isn't robust enough. It's based on the diameter of the pipe and the system in place that you can only move so much water through that size of pipe. Uh, the city did respond very quickly and did boost the pressure in the area. Obviously there's concerns and some parameters that they have to work in with the limits on those pressures based on the system capacity as well. Again, um, I understand many of the homeowners trying to protect their structures. From what I saw, a lot of them were wetting tile roofs, um, concrete driveways, things like that, things that were not going to burn, that impacts the system as well. Um, so there were, no, there were no issues with the city water supply. There was a momentary decrease in pressure, as we stated, and that's due to all those units operating on the system at the same time. Uh, there's really nothing that could be done about that, uh, and it, it's truly just a capacity of the system and it, it functioned as designed. 
Um, your questions about the clearance. Yes, there are options for greater clearance. Um, I don't believe that that, in my assessment, that wasn't necessarily a factor in this. Um, I, you know, I'm not the investigator on this structure fire piece. I suspect from looking at these pictures, from being there that day, that in, this happens frequently in these types of incidents, some burning materials made it through uh, one of the attic vents and got into the attic. The fire started inside the attic. Uh, the clearance would help a little bit with that potentially, but again, what I mentioned earlier in terms of the topography, the location of that home, uh, incredible view, uh, but at the top of really, it's a draw or shoot, the, the fire is going to move up very quickly up that and bring, and you can see from the, not only the video but the pictures as well, there was a substantial wind pushing that. Uh, so the, the clearance, not a huge issue. Um, you would also note in some of those pictures that some of the ornamental vegetation, some plants that were green and alive uh, burned um, at that residence, some of the neighbor's residence, all those things burned as well. So you have to factor in all those other pieces of it. Did I address all the questions? Have I, did I miss anything? Right. Okay, do we have anybody else from the public that would like to speak or ask a question? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to bring it back to the board for board comments. Chief, thank, thank you very much for your uh, report on that. Um, I know every fire is unique and different. Um, and I hear often, you know, I'm not a firefighter, so I, I don't know this stuff. Um, the, an attic fire, generally in a wind-driven fire, once an ember gets inside an attic, how long is it before that's a raging fire? A number of factors uh, pertain to that. Obviously, the size of the structure, the, the, uh, how dry the material is, so the age of the home. Yeah. Uh, this was a very well-built home. Uh, this was not a conventional track home. Uh, a conventional track home, the roof would have come in much quicker. Very solid built home, dimensional lumber, things like that. So there's some positive things on that side with this home. But it doesn't take long. And this, from personal experience, 2003, I was at the old fire in San Bernardino. It's Santa Ana, wind-driven fire. Um, hundreds of homes were burned. Most of them were burned by embers that made it into the attic. Uh, you could see a little glow uh, in there. And if crews could get in there very, very quickly, meaning within 30 seconds to 60 seconds, and these were small 900 to maybe 1,200 square foot homes. Get inside, find the attic scuttle, single story homes, and get a hose line up into the attic, you might have had a chance to stop it. But once you get a strong wind behind it, it's fanned through the attic, very difficult. A home, especially a two story home, but a home of this size, very labor intensive. Uh, pulling ceiling, very difficult work, especially in full PPE. You have to start rotating crews pretty quickly. Uh, it's very, very difficult to do. It, it takes hand tools called pipe poles. You shove them through the drywall, twist and pull, pull it down. It's got to be a coordinated effort, uh, and that's with full protective equipment, SCBA on, and trying to get to the seat of the fire. So it, it can happen very quickly. There's not necessarily a standard time frame there, uh, but with a wind pushing it, it gets well established. And again, um, the majority of our personnel that were at the incident were dressed in PPE for the wildland event. That's what they responded to and then have to transition to a structure fire. So there's a piece there that we are mandated that they have to dress appropriately for that uh, or significant violations, uh, and it's a, against policy, and it's a poor safety practice. So there's some time frame components there, the number of resources that you have to have. So unfortunately, by the time the crew got to that uh, structure, it was too late, uh, and there was no saving that home. Uh, very, very sad set of circumstances, uh, but based on... Uh, the incident as it, on its own, um, there's just simply not enough resources available fast enough to get enough personnel inside that home with hose lines uh, to, and it, it comes down to, it's a math equation, uh, BTUs, British Thermal Units, and you have to cool it down enough, and British Thermal Unit is the amount of heat it takes to raise one pound of water one degree, you have to be able to put enough water on that fire to cool it to stop the fire spread, and very difficult to do in that scenario. Excellent. My last question is uh, more for the future. Um, I, I, I saw in the fire that happened in Anaheim uh, when a bunch of houses burned in the Anaheim Hills area off the toll road there. Um, and I've seen it before where people have decorative palm trees by their house. And I've heard that that's just like a Roman candle going off and puts out a lot of embers right at the eave level of a house. So you're correct, uh, and that is a common issue uh, in the wildland area. 
the what's unique about palm trees, um, and they're beautiful trees. Uh, if you keep them well trimmed and all the palm fronds off, usually not an issue. But the shape and size of those dead fronds uh, is it really is conducive to carrying those embers a great distance uh, from the fire front. A number of years ago in Chino, so not a normally necessarily a wild and urban interface area uh, in the northern portion of Chino, more of the uh, equestrian area or agriculture areas, we had a fire burning through early in the season uh, with a Santa Ana blowing, uh, excuse me, an onshore wind blowing, but it actually burned a palm tree. A mile away, we had a uh, roof fire. It had a shake shingle roof, but it, a mile from the incident uh, that was related to a palm frond carrying that far in the wind. So they do carry a great distance. Uh, with that, I would like to encourage the public to really focus on uh, making sure that they have appropriate screens on their attic vents. Uh, that's one of the big keys. Uh, sprinklers are mandated in all new homes uh, in the state of California, fire sprinklers. Obviously, when a fire starts in the attic, that's a different scenario. Um, and I don't want to misspeak. Our fire marshal here, uh, is it mandated in the attic space or is that an option? It's typically not required in a residential structure. Thank you. Um, if I were building a home uh, and there were an option of, of putting fire sprinklers in the attic, uh, I would sprinkler my attic. But there's also some devices that are designed with heat to actually close uh, the attic space off, the gable vents and all the vents on the attic. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. I have some I have some. So um, first, I want to say it was so heartbreaking to see that we lost a structure, a home, somebody's, you know, life, their entire life. And I wish that the circumstances could have been different. Um, I, I hate to see it anywhere else, but when it's in our own home and in our district and something that we're working on, it's even, you know, felt really heartbreaking for my, I'm sure the rest of the board and staff and everyone involved you're um, correct. Chief, if I could just comment on that, um, absolutely correct. Yeah. We do deal with structure fires on a regular basis, yeah. uh, but I think it is a little bit more difficult in terms of acceptance for us and um, obviously more empathetic to the situation when the fire doesn't actually start in the home. Um, the vast majority of structure fires we go to begin in the home, not necessarily the fault of the resident, uh, but when it's a fire that starts elsewhere and spreads, it, it makes it a little bit more, I think, the acceptance piece, mm -hmm. um, it, it's a tragic set of circumstances. So I, I do agree and understand what you're saying, and, and staff feels the same way. Yeah. And so, Chief, you said with the, um, with where the home is positioned, um, that the fire moves quite quickly up the hill. You, you called it a chimney, in a sense. So it, it just... Just fires right up that. that that's correct. Uh, with the with wildland training that we provide to our personnel, and this isn't specific to us. This is general wildland training. Um, if homes were not there, and say there were a fire road cut through there, that would be a place that you would not stop a fire engine or commit a crew mm -hmm. um, based on that, because that's going to actually draw the fire up there faster than anywhere else with that topography. Um, and it's just the, the number of factors. Uh, in a normal situation, fire burns about 16 times faster uphill than it does on flat ground. Uh, you factor in some wind behind it, and then it starts to preheat, and it burns even faster uphill. But the, the shape of the topography there, it's truly a chimney draw. There's a number of names that are used for it, but it actually pulls the fire that direction pretty quickly. Okay. Um, I, I did have some feedback from residents, and I am going to... I. I, some of the items were addressed, but I do want to just bring them up again and ask you to please. Um, there were several 911 calls on Mo Montserrat Court. Montserrat court. Um, however, residents there didn't receive um, assistance. Um, I did. I did notate that you said that um, there was an individual who called 911 that their daughter was trapped in a home on Montserrat Court as well, and that you, we quickly went from um, fire to saving lives. Can you talk about that, please? Can you just? Absolutely, and thank I think you. The, the point of, uh, that I included, and there were some other notations that are in, these are the CAD notes from the fire site. And again, keep in mind uh, that the, this dispatch center is not directly communicating with the person that's running the incident. This is our normal dispatch center, but they're relaying this information. So that's in the midst of all the other activity. They're trying to get this information to the incident commander, the appropriate person, to make sure that they're aware of it. But the, the incident priority shifts. Once the life piece becomes involved, and, and this is why we encourage the public to evacuate 
uh, when appropriate, the Ready, Set, Go program. And also, for people that don't live in the area, stay away. Uh, once we throw the human factor in, that shifts our priorities. Uh, it's life, property, and then environment. So once you get that call that there's potentially someone trapped, there is a resource shift that takes place. Uh, also keep in mind, as that information is coming in, uh, although the incident commander is a distance from there and may not physically see what's going on, that information is being relayed, not from just dispatch, but also from crews on the ground with what they're seeing, and then the air resources that are there. So just because someone didn't necessarily have a fire engine that responded to their residence, and, and again, uh, we cover 80 square miles, 100, roughly 175,000 people live in our community, we have seven fire engines. Yes, we had lots of help from neighboring agencies, we don't have the resources available to put an engine at every single home that's structured, uh, structured that's threatened. Uh, it's the best utilization of resources based on the circumstances uh, that are occurring and where they can safely operate. And especially in that area, there's a, a number of large homes uh, that it would potentially take more than one piece of equipment to protect those properties. So uh, they may not see uh, fire engines there. It's a quickly, uh, it's a dynamic environment. Things are happening quickly. Uh, and although the fire may be burning in those areas, it may not be the priority. Although it, it, to those folks that are the homeowners that are there, it's a huge priority. But based on the topography, uh, the wind, and all those factors, and again, the helicopter pilots, and there's also someone in charge of that that's flying, that's seeing what's going on, uh, has a good idea of where that fire may head next and will shift the resources in that direction and recognize there may be a finger of fire or a portion of the fire burning, but it may be in lighter f uh, fuels and not essentially a, a threat to their structures. So they may opt to bypass those and put the resources elsewhere. Okay. That was actually going to be one of my questions about the helicopters um, that are flying around. Um, if they report back as to what's going on in the area and um, et cetera. Um, let me see here. I had... So, um, in regards to the staged uh, crews that were on Chino Avenue, I just want to confirm that um, those were on standby. You did a back burn for those, and they were on standby in the um, in case there was a jump in fire. Is that correct or what? That's correct. So those crews were just initially assigned to the fire. Uh, the captain saw a threat. He was actually responding to another location, saw what he believed was a threat uh, with the fire potentially coming, uh, stopped me. We did have some communication problems, and I, I spoke about this at the Fire Safe Council last, last week and then a little bit last night at the council meeting. Some areas we had difficulties getting out on the radio, and it's, it's a combination of um, we had transitioned from our typical 800 megahertz system to a VHF, very high frequency radio system, and that allows us to talk to our neighboring agencies. Um, and you have to hit the proper repeater and have the right tone, but topography becomes a major issue. So depending on where the command post is, um, you may have some issues when you have people that are down in the bottom of a canyon or there's hills in between, it's a little difficult to communicate. Again, we had a large number of, of resources there trying to communicate. They do start to split the incident to some different tactical channels, uh, but it was very difficult to, uh, to get out. Um, that captain had attempted to get in, in touch with operations, uh, was not getting a response. Operations was answering him. He couldn't hear it. Um, based on some of those issues. So there were some communications issues there. The captain, and his point of stopping me was to get authority to do that uh, because it has to be a coordinated effort. And again, based on what we saw at the time, um, I gave him approval to proceed with the firing operation. We had limited resources on scene. Uh, three people from Chino Fire, not including myself, uh, but we had the water tender, so we had 2,000 gallons of water there. We had some water on the engine, but not a lot of help. Uh, and the concern was if they did nothing, that we were going to have a large area of a, a fast-moving fire front uh, hit Chino Avenue, Chino Avenue and potentially spread to the other side, which would have threatened, if you remember that slide that I showed, a large number of homes. We had some, some heavier fuel and some very steep uh, topography to deal with if the fire were to cross Chino Avenue. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And then... Um can you please, because in, in your report, um, you mentioned the CLO, which is an acronym, but I'm going to ask if you can please, for the public, um, let them know what the CLO and what um, resources we provide with that. Thank you. Again, I speaking in code and no one called me on it, so I appreciate you bringing that up. It's the community liaison officer, and those are members of our staff typically from our community risk reduction side. Uh, that are called out to an incident, typically a fire, 
And the purpose of that uh, position is to assist the homeowner or resident uh, with their needs. What that does, it, it, a couple things. One, it's a huge help to them, uh, which is first and foremost, uh, they, they can help them get in touch with their insurance company. They can put them in contact with the Red Cross, take care of some of their immediate needs, uh, assist, provide a, a phone to make some phone calls temporarily, things like that. So not only does it help that resident, it also helps our folks on scene. Uh, the incident commander, typically battalion chief, is focused on the operations that are taking place, trying to protect uh, as much property as possible and may not have the time to have a calm, caring uh, conversation with the homeowner. So it, it, it really facilitates two things. First and foremost, it's for the resident or the residents of our community. But secondly, it assists our crews because it shifts that, uh, that need to uh, interact extensively with the homeowner, allows them to focus on safe operations and doing uh, the best that they can with the resources that they have on hand. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I've ha I had residents that asked me how they can help um, during a, sc a scenario like that. I know that we want them to leave, but when they feel their homes are being threatened and they go back and they, you know, try to water um, in behind those homes there, there's a lot of um, fuel, as we um, refer to it, and they were trying to keep their, you know, areas green. Is there anything else um, that you can suggest for residents that they can do to help? So there's lots of information on our website, uh, the Ready, Set, Go. It's a, a whole program for fire safety, uh, especially in the wildland urban interface. But brush clearance is important. Again, the attic vents, make sure that you have proper screens on those. Uh, limit the debris that you have, uh, dead pine needles, things like that. Um, oftentimes you may have things in rain gutters, uh, leaves that may burn if an ember hits them. So stay ahead of things like that, but make sure you have proper clearance, um, non-combustible siding, non-combustible roof. Uh, you know, if you have firewood, don't store it near the home. Try to keep any combustibles away. Uh, if the fire is approaching your home, um, make sure that you close your windows, things like that, that uh, any opportunity to keep the fire out. But again, make sure it's clear. Uh, check our website for some additional resources. If they have some questions, we'd be happy to answer those. But make sure that they have good brush clearance. If they don't live in those areas, please stay out. I do understand uh, the homeowner's desire to protect their property, uh, and, and it is a very legitimate concern. Uh, and we were very fortunate that we didn't have anyone from the public that was injured that I'm aware of with this incident. Um, your home is not worth your life. Uh, it is unfortunate when, when homes are destroyed, especially when it's, it's, uh, it's those significant items, uh, not necessarily of a, a financial impact, but more of the memories that are associated with mm -hmm. photo albums and, and mementos that are more, far more important than the um, tangible things. So uh, focus on those things. Have a list of what you need. Know where your documents are. I would highly recommend that they purchase a fire safe for important documents or store those in a safe deposit box. Uh, somewhere else, or save that information elsewhere, things like that. But there's some more resources available on our website that can help. Okay. Thank you so much, Chief. That concludes my questions, but I'm going to ask um, President DeMonico if after the board's comments, if we can give our residents our one more chance to maybe ask some follow-up questions to what we asked today. If, just give them another opportunity if we can. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I think we all agree it's just horrible and disappointing that we, we did lose a home. But I do appreciate the report, getting an understanding and a perspective of what happened <clears throat> and when, the reactions, the responses. Uh, I think we're extremely blessed to have so many other agencies that responded so quickly and so well to help us. It was a tr just a tremendous effort. Um, and I think we all appreciate the support and response we got. So I think we... In addition to what this district did and the response that we did here, um, the support we got was just it was amazing. I just want to recognize that. Thank you. And, and you're correct. I appreciate those comments. And we did get a very robust response from our partner agencies. Uh, and President DeMonico, with his background in the fire service, understands this. We were very fortunate we were the first fire. Um, that first fire that's in a, a region, uh, you can get a lot of resources pretty quickly. But if you're the second or third fire, um, it's a different situation. So we were very fortunate that there weren't any other active fires um, taking place at the same time, that we were able to get those resources here very, very quickly. Uh, a, a couple more points, and, and I, I think our crews did an outstanding job, a very complex incident to deal with, uh, faced with a structure threat very, very quickly. 
Uh, and again, we have limited resources. We have one battalion chief. Uh, we, uh, the battalion chief ended up assigning a captain, an engine company captain, and he did a phenomenal job running the operations of the fire firm. We don't have the depth and staff um, to do that, and it's just one of the challenges that we face uh, with where, how we're set up. One last thing, um, tremendous support from the residents of our community. Uh, our engines are equipped to take care of their, our employees' needs uh, for a, a relatively short duration, very hot day. Um, they depleted their ice chest pretty quickly. All of our engines carry ice chests with some drinks. Uh, we had a number of residents that provided not only drinks, but we actually at the command post, um, personal ice chests from some of the homeowners there filled with ice and water uh, for our firefighters. So very appreciative of the support that we received from the community. Mr. Williams. Uh, yes, sir, Chief, thank you. Um, Having been a firefighter for 33 years, I know things have changed from when I first started and when I was on the department. Uh, when you were on the department, uh, when you started, uh, did we have hard lines on most of the engines or very many of the engines? So yes. The real lines? Yes. Do how, how many of our units now have real lines and hard lines? Uh, do most of them come with it or not? We do, but we do not use those for wildland operations. <clears throat> Do they have beam gun, beam, beam gun still, or do they use just a regular hose nozzle? They just have a regular nozzle. Okay, so they they don't uh, use the real lines then very often. Not for this type of incident, no. Okay, I was just curious. Um, you know, I'm not trying to play, uh, you know, Monday morning quarterback or anything. I'm just wanting to know how much the the firefighting tactics have changed from when I was on and how things have gone and and so on. So on this particular fire, did, do you know of any of the units that might have used the real lines, or did they all use the inch and a half lines? They did not use the real lines. Uh, that would not be a very safe or common practice. Uh, typically, it's either progressive hose lays, uh, if they're trying to flank a fire, or uh, they may pull a pre-connect and extend it, or use the wildland packs uh, directly from the engine. But to get to the back of the residence, a little more volume of water, and then they have the flexibility of dropping in uh, some Ys and some Ts where they can branch the lines off in different directions, and then those can stay in for mop-up operations if needed as well. Okay. And uh, the other thing that came to my mind uh, during your presentation was uh, the fact of how far do you think the fire was from the house that burned when it actually well, got the ember or the ember got to it or whatever. Uh, was was the fire away, quite a ways away still, or was it pretty close, or do you know? With, I, I actually, I'm really unable to answer that, but based on some of the pictures that I've seen, uh, that home uh, and the neighboring homes took a tremendous amount of heat. Uh, there's, again, some ornamental vegetation in the neighboring yards, uh, a distance from the slope that had uh, either browned or blackened leaves on trees that were very healthy. Um, so a tremendous amount of heat. At what point that ember entered the attic, I don't know. Uh, whether it was when the fire was, you know, 500 yards from the home or when it was actually burning up that slope uh, with some force behind it, it really, I really can't say. Um, I would assume that the, from the reports I saw, some, the homeowners were, were trying to protect the structure. Uh, they would probably have a better idea and, and might be able to speak to that, uh, but, but I, I can't uh, provide you with a, an opinion one way or another on that. And you had said that it'd be a good idea to have screens on, like, those gables and things. Were those open uh, where the embers could go in, or do you know? I don't know. Okay. Uh, I, I believe that's about all the questions I have. Thank you. I, uh, having had a little bit of experience in the fire service, I just want to say that was a tremendous stop. The conditions there were incredible and conducive to a large fire. We've had some large fires in California. Um, Director Revenger and I mm -hmm. just uh, attended a, an overview of the campfire, that's the Paradise Fire, by, uh, by Chief Hawks. And they talk about ember ignitions and what em ember ignitions do. And these fires take off and you start getting these <coughs> ember ignitions. And, uh, you know, uh, we lost the structure and that's devastating, but we could have lost a lot more with ember ignitions. Mm -hmm. These ember ignitions, they can travel for miles. They get up there and they go. And, uh, and it's just incredible of, of, of the devastation they can cause. And we can go back in history and we can look at some of the large fires. We had Laguna, we've had Malibu, we had uh, uh, Sonoma County, uh, we just had the one up towards, uh, not Summerlin, um, Montecito, Santa Barbara. 
and and they and these you know we lose five six hundred homes or more in these fires and the campfire took out a whole city, but I, I you know I looked at that fire I went by afterwards and I, I looked at it and I looked at the conditions I looked at what was there I knew what the weather was, and I just have to say that was really a, a tremendous stop, and for the limited amount of resources we have for initial attack on those things, the guys did a phenomenal job and I want to thank them and congratulate them on the job well done. And uh, with that, I do want to open it up to any more Wait, public director, comment. I'm sorry, President DeMonico, I just have one more thing. Oh, sure. So, Chief, I want to apologize. I was so busy grilling and drilling you that I did not, at the end of my comments, thank you and um, our staff and everyone involved for um, taking care of the issue in our backyard and such. So my apologies. I, I know I'm, I'm, I had a lot to say. And I did not thank you guys. I do appreciate everything that was done that day. Um, thank so thank you very much, and my apologies to everybody. I didn't. I hope I didn't offend anyone by being rude and not doing that. And thank, that's all. Thank I you. I was not offended. One more thing. Krieger, stop. Yeah, water, water pressure uh, was a question, and I don't think we addressed it. I believe that initially uh, we asked for an increase in water pressure in that area. And I don't think we addressed yes. that. Yes, um, yeah. so I can probably a little further on that. So the incident commander did ask the city to increase the water pressure early on. That did occur. Uh, and our, our PIO did speak uh, at the incident that we did have a momentary decrease in pressure. And again, uh, back to what I discussed before with the scenario of the shower, the washing machine being on, the sprinklers and toilets flushing at the same time, that was what was experienced uh, with the incident, so we had a number of engines pulling from the system at the same time. If I could just clarify one comment, and I, I want to be clear to the board and the public, I was not the fire investigator that investigated the structure fire. I strongly suspect that it was an ember that moved into the attic, but I don't know that factually, but that's based on my experience, what I've seen before and from those photos. So I just want to, for the record, make sure that that's clear. Uh, and again, I would imagine that the homeowner and the neighbors in that area probably have a better indication of where the fire started, but I strongly suspect that that's the case. Um, I'm not certain about that. I, I would have to check with our investigator on that one. Okay, and I'd like to open it back up to the public for any public comments, questions, clarity. I have a question. Please. I, I'm Anita Bachman. Can you come uh, up to the resident microphone? of Chino Hills. Excuse me. How's everybody? <laughs> and we moved out here 23 years ago, and I live up on the slope to a hill with a fantastic view, with my street name, so I'm very happy. <laughs> but I have a question, because they planted, the city planted some trees, and as you mentioned about the palm trees, my concern is about my eucalyptus trees. They're about 40, 50 feet, you know, above my house level, and the trees are kind of dying. And my question is, um, in case of a fire, what will happen, you know, if the fire come and the tree catch on fire? It's going to tip right over to the roof of my home. So I want someone to come out and then, you know, inspect. I'll take a look at it. I asked for years to have it trimmed down, and they did that. But now it's exceeded in height so tall. So that's my concern. So is that one of the trees also that... So, with ambers? So a different type of tree, there could potentially be some issues with that. A lot of it would be driven by the weather conditions. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have some strong wind, the health of the tree and things like that. Yes, um, we do have some ability with the fire code to have trees trimmed up to a certain height or if they are a danger tree, meaning that it's dead, to help uh, mitigate that. Um, there's a council member here that's I'm hearing your comments and, and our staff, and I'll ask someone to uh, provide you with a okay, business card. That. We can have one of our inspectors go out and take a look at it, uh, but we also can put you in contact uh, with some folks through the city that may be able to provide some assistance or at least take a look at it to see if it's an issue and if we can provide some help with, with addressing your concerns with that. Okay. Uh, but if you could have our fire marshal, if, if Danielle, if you could provide her with a business card, I'd appreciate that. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you. Chief, just a quick comment. I'm a council member, but our city manager, Ben. Montgomery is going to get information. Oh, I, I'm oh. sorry. I didn't even see him back there. He's, uh, Mossiel's blocking him out for me. I, I apologize, Ben. I didn't see you there. He, you were probably okay with me not pointing you out, though, back there. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Do we have any other requests to speak? 
we have any last comments from the board? Okay, this doesn't require a motion. It'll be received and file. We'll go ahead and receive and file. The time is 7.30. We're going to go ahead and take a 10-minute break. Okay, item number eight, Fire Board Policy 1080.4, Community Liaisons. Purposes for the Board of Directors to review Board of Directors Policy 1080.4, Community Liaisons, and consider amending the policy to include the Inland Empire Utilities Agency, IEUA, as a community liaison. President DeMonico, members of the Board, at the July 10th, 2019 regular Board meeting, Steve Eli, Board President of the IEUA, requested that the Board of Directors consider adding IEUA to the Fire District's Community Liaison List on the Board agenda, as well as consider appointing a liaison from the Fire District to serve as an IEUA Community Liaison. It is recommended that the Board of Directors approve the amendment to the Fire Board Policy 1080.4 Community Liaisons to include the Inland Empire Utility Agency. Okay, um, with that we have one request to speak. Well, first of all, I request any public comment. With that we have one request to speak. Steve Eli. I just uh, think that it would be a good idea. We work well together. Our agencies work well together. Your agencies, certainly your personal has trained our, thank you, Jesus. No one has ever accused me of being quiet. <laughs> has trained our, our, our staff. Um, just talked tonight with Tim about um, maybe some training going on at our facilities for your personnel. So in any event, I, I won't promise to come every month. I might be able to send a staff person if I can't be here, but I'd welcome the opportunity to work with one of you um, and have you come to our meetings every once in a while and talk about what's going on. In, in Chino, we have major facilities here. You know, We're a fairly large employer, and also we have significant facilities which have um, unique characteristics. So with that, uh, I'd answer any questions, uh, but I, I, I think it's a great idea. Meeting date and time. Yeah. We meet our, our regular board meetings the third Wednesday of every month at 10 a.m. Yeah, the regular board meetings would be, make more sense than the workshops. Right. Okay, well, thank you. Sure. And, Thanks. Uh, ask any other public uh, comment or input? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for uh, board comment and input. I'll start. Sure. So I think it's a, it'll be a great idea um, to better partner and get a little closer with the IEUA. They're right here in our backyard. We've actually been partners with them, but we haven't officially um, participated in each other's meetings other than um, when we have activities. So I personally think it's a great idea. It's just my comment on that. Thank you. Uh, I do as well. I think it'd be a, a very good to get to know their operations better and, and understand it. I mean, obviously, we uh, we are interconnected with them in, in many ways. Um, and uh, so I think it'd be a good idea to have a better understanding and have a better liaison with them. Agree with all the comments so far. Okay. I have a motion? Okay, I'll so moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 5 0. I didn't vote, uh, yeah. Mr. President. Oh, you didn't vote? No, I think I should abstain. I don't have any liaisons, and I feel under the circumstances okay. it's best for me not to vote. Let's correct the vote. Four, four to zero with one abstention. And uh, uh, we'll make an appointment here real quick. We'll get that out via email. So we'll move on to item number nine staff support request from Director Williams. Purposes for the board directors to receive information about a request for staff support from Director Williams and provide direction to staff. Report by Fire Chief Tim Schalkler. President Tomonico, members of the board, good evening once again. During the board comment portion of the July 31st, 2019 special meeting, Director Williams stated, I still need help with my computer, so if sometime in the future we could arrange that. It was assumed that this comment from Director Williams was a request for staff support. On August 8, 2019, I received an email from Director Williams with three requests. 
one of which was related to this topic, so I can indeed confirm that he is requesting staff support related to computer use. Uh, it is recommended that the Board of Directors discuss this item and provide direction to staff. Before I open this up to the public, what are you requesting, Mr. Williams? What I would like to do is uh, get the staff support that I was getting before I was uh, muted, so to speak, and told not to come in and all that kind of stuff, and not to talk to anybody. What and specific staff report are you looking for? Well, when I'd come in, I'd talk to them and I'd say, well, can you help me out? And I was getting some very good help and uh, I was moving ahead. And um, my biggest problem was is uh, I had spent over $1,000 for this uh, iPad because I was a board member. And then um, I was having problems at home. Now, <laughs> it's ironic because two days ago my son came and he got, he got this thing working at my house. That's the first time it's worked at my house. But um, <coughs> so anyway, that, that part of it is really going to help me out a lot, but um, I still need, you know, help getting on the computer and doing things, and I get uh, emails uh, that I need to put in for something, and I have no idea how to do it. And uh, it's, it's not, I don't think, a great deal of help. It's just normal help, but under the circumstances when I'm muted and I can't talk to anybody and I can't uh, come in and just say, hey, I need some help on this, it, it really uh, puts a burden on me. So um, <coughs> because of the circumstances, um, I think that if it was one of you four, that there wouldn't be any problem. But because it's me and everybody wants to think that I'm a bad guy and I'm the, <coughs> the problem here and all that stuff, uh, there, there is a problem. And so uh, I don't know what to say other than I do need some help still on the computer, and um, well, that, that's that's all I need. I mean, I was getting help from Chris there, and uh, also from Ariana when she was here, and so on. And uh, um, they were very very uh, helpful, and they were helping me out and showing me how to access certain things on the computer and so on. And then I was told, don't talk to anybody, don't come in. In other words, just stay away and uh, cause problems. Okay. okay, I'm going to open this up to public comment. Does anybody, Charlie. would anybody from the public like to comment on this as an agenda item? Charlie. I'd like to address this to Mr. Williams. All you're asking for is right computer here. assistance and training so that you can get up. Excuse me, Charlie, could you come to the podium, please? Oh. Thank you. That's usually not what I have to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get it. I get it. Is it on? Yeah, it is. Okay. Thank you. This is from Mr. Williams. What you're basically asking for, just so I can, you know, make sure I understand, you would like computer assistance and training so that you are a 21st century person. Am with I computers. To answer? Yeah. Uh, okay. He's he's directing a question. To I'm me. directing it right to you. And. Uh, because yes. I want to understand exactly what you're asking. That's exactly what I'm asking for. Yes, sir. Okay, so to bring yourself into the 21st century, that's what you're asking for, right? That is correct. That's all I need to know. Thank you very much. Would any, any other public comment? Anybody else in public like to comment on this item? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for board comments. I <coughs> Well, I know Director Krieger was... I, I mean, I just have some basic questions. So, so, you get email on your iPad, right? I get email, yeah. But okay. It's not on my iPad. Oh, or... On my wife's computer and stuff. Okay, well, you can get email on your iPad, I'm sure, as well. Um, and obviously, you're looking at an agenda. No, I'm looking at the agenda. Last week, I couldn't look at the agenda. Our last meeting, I couldn't look at the agenda. I couldn't bring it up. Okay. I, I, I guess I'm confused as well over what, what you need. We do everything over email. 
or looking at the agenda meeting notes with the supporting documents that's part of the agenda. So I I guess I'm confused on what you're asking for as well. Well, there have been certain things that I've like, been like, asked like, for. Like you say, like logging on to a computer. What computer are you talking about? I've never used a computer here, and I've been here and six years. They asked for some things about, say, mileage or certain things, and I had no idea how to do it. I, I couldn't do it. But, um, right now, I'm, I'm unable. I didn't write them down, and I didn't bring them with me. But when they come up, it would be nice to be able to call somebody and say, well, how do I do this or something like that. See, my, my situation is, is when I got on the board and uh, before you guys decided to stymie me. Let's, let's just stick to uh, No, no, this is topic. sticking to this. I paid $1,000 for this. Okay. And, you know, I planned on, you know, being a good board member and trying to get all this stuff up. And I was talking, like I say, to... Uh, staff and having them help me and they were directing me okay you do this you do this you do this and I knew I wasn't going to remember it on just one time but then I got noticed that I was uh, not allowed to talk to anybody I wasn't allowed to come to the station and stuff like that so it stymied me and it stopped everything and um, I've been a good boy now for three months I haven't come to the stations or I haven't talked to the anybody I haven't come to admin you guys have done exactly what you want to do you've pushed me out of the system and the only time I come here is during these meetings and that seems to be what you want to do now one time I know Sarah said about three months ago she says well if you just do it for 30 days it's been 90 days now Sarah are you ready to, are you ready to put me back in the system let me be a board member or are you guys going to continue what you're doing or we're getting off topic. We're no, we're not. This is all. This is all part of being part of the part of the board member, and that's what I'm asking. I'm asking, can I come and and learn how to use the computer, or are, are we going to continue the way we are? I think my, my feeling is that in about three years and three months, if I don't come to the stations and I don't do anything. You guys will go ahead and say, okay, when now you can come back in. And that'll be the end of my term. I, I don't think you have any plans at all of letting me uh, be reinstated to being a board member, to tell you the truth. And the only reason I'm here is because you can't fire me. That, that's not part of this topic, right? We can't even be discussing that right now because it's not agendized. I, I guess I'm just... I, you're able to get email. You're able to pull up the the, the stuff. The if you need to do an expense report, it can be emailed and you can print it off. So I I guess I'm I guess I'm just confused overall by what what your actual re request is. It's, I mean, you've shown that you're able to do this stuff. So um, that's it. That's. So, okay. Well, I, I, I want clarification. With those iPads, we have opportunities when we purchase to purchase what's called Apple Care, where the, you can sit and you can have someone train you on that. Um, the district does, you know, we did show you up front, but I want to see that you're making an effort as well. There's YouTube videos. There's different ways that you can learn. There's even um, adult school classes that can help with these types of issues. Um, can you please, I know you said you didn't bring it today, but you know I need to know specifically what you need to know about a computer. You come with, with typed up reports um, that you're talking about, um, letters that you send in, you know, emails, et cetera. So I'm kind of confused here. Are you doing that or is someone else doing those for you? Um, so if you can just clarify, I need to know better before I agree to any so any additional support. It's been eight months. You've been on the board eight months now. Someone else is doing it for me. They're helping me out. Okay, well, I hope that they're not helping you with anything that we discuss, you know, that's not supposed to be, they're not supposed to be involved in. But, okay, so someone's helping you. I, I'm done. Chief, do we have, I'm, 
Director Williams' comment, there's been some help. He's received si significant help, I believe, in the past. From the, do we have any idea what amount of help in, do we have? Do we documented? Yes, sir. Any of that? Yes, sir. I, I can speak to that. Uh, early on, as Director Williams indicated, we did provide some staff support to him uh, through a combination of the orientation and uh, desktop login support. Uh, we have. Uh, essentially 10 different times that we provided, and these are documented times, staff support, initial orientation on 12.5, uh, this is 12.5.18, 12.11.18 desktop login setup uh, and training, 12.19 iPad setup with IT staff and some basic training with that, 1.7.19 iPad training, 1.16.19 login review training with Director Williams and his wife, 1.22.19 login training with Director Williams and his wife to reply to emails, 1.23.19 uh, 19 login training, 124 login training, 129 19. He attended the introduction to computer schools class that the board uh, determined was appropriate. That was a three hour course. Uh, and then on 417, some basic iPad uh, training with the setup of his new iPad. Uh, in total, about 10 sessions. Uh, most of the sessions with our staff lasted about an hour, and typically we had two people involved in that. So, roughly about 20 staff hours. Uh, and those are the documented uh, instances that we've provided some, some uh, introductory training to Director Williams. Okay. So this item's on the agenda. We know it's on the agenda, and you're, if I'm understanding you right, Director Williams, you, you have a list, but you didn't bring it to detail the help you're specifically asking for. What, what I heard you say is you need help getting on a computer, and you need help emails. Emails, no idea how to do it, and yet... As Director um, Ronald Sevinger has pointed out, I received an email, a very detailed, articulate email from you here very recently. So I'm of the impression you know how to do an email. In addition, we have, as a district, invested a lot of time and effort training you. We paid for a class in addition to that. And in an effort, in my opinion, to train you on something that you have a responsibility to learn. We're talking basic computer skills, login, turning on a computer, doing emails. This is, this is our responsibility. This is not a district responsibility. And I think from what I understand, the district's gone above and beyond trying to assist you with some very basic computer skills. And to me, this is your responsibility. There's classes, there's, there's other opportunities to get that kind of training, to get that kind of knowledge if it's something you need. Sounds like you've got family members who may be able to help, but I don't see this as a district responsibility. This is not about muting you or you can't talk to anybody. If, this is, if there's something related to some, some agenda item, that's a different issue. But in terms of help, in terms of train computer training, I don't see that as a district responsibility I, I don't and based on the limited input you've given us tonight about getting on a computer and emails I I, I don't see any anything okay to or not to okay I, I can see where this is going there's a statement in board policy it says that staff should help board members and once in a while I need help and that's all I'm saying is if I could I, the way I did it is I'd call up or something as a rule. Now, several times I came in here with my wife. You heard him, heard the chief say it. And she would help me. And the staff would come in and talk to us, and they'd help. And I thought that was very accommodating and very good. And I had, and that's the kind of thing that was great. You know, they, they wanted to help. And... Now I can't come in. Now I can't see anybody. I can't talk to anybody. I can't do anything. And so a lot of those skills are gone, and uh, they stopped and so on. And that's all I'm saying is I've been a good boy now for 90 days, and uh, I don't really feel that you guys are interested in me being really a participant on the board. I'm not going away. I'm going to be here, and all I'm saying is, is I'd like to be a member, but if you don't want me to be a member, that's fine. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to take my time now, and I'm going to make my comments. Mr. Williams, you've been censured twice, and if you read the censures and see why you've been censured, you'll know why 
you you can't come in and talk to staff like you used to because you caused it. You caused the anxiety, the hostileness that <coughs> comes around with the way you interact with staff, and you've been censured twice for it. And that's that's why it's there, and that's why that's why you're limited. Nobody's denying you support that you rightfully would need or deserve. But when it comes to computer training, first of all, we're not employees. So we're not subject to tuition reimbursement or any of those benefits for classes that we want to take to further our own personal knowledge on things, which computers is one of those. It's the 20, Mr. Charlie Blank said, it's the 21st century. Everybody's on computers these days. Uh, you know, I didn't want to learn computers. I didn't want to learn how to text on my iPhone and do all those things, but I did because I had to do that to survive, but I did that on my own, and I didn't ask for uh, the department to teach me how to do those things. That's not the district's responsibility. It's your personal responsibility if you want to learn that. And so I, I'm opposed to providing you that support. Very good. You've stated your feelings. It's not, uh, doesn't surprise me any, and that's all I wanted to know. Thank you. I, I have one question. Is Director Williams still able to send emails to the chief requesting support and then the support, the chief assists with those comments? Like if he has a question about an email or, you know, stuff like that, he still sends inquiries in, correct? And it goes through. That was I get a lot of help from my wife. If you want to know the truth, I okay. get a lot of help from my wife. So maybe... And this is me. When I have to learn something, I should. I don't rely on other people. I just sit down and I just. It's a repetitive thing that I do, and um, I have to learn it. So, I see you say be, you're saying that because you haven't had support, you've forgotten or you're not able to do it anymore. You need to take that initiative as well and do something. In in when you do something repetitive. You, you get it. That's very fine. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate you guys' concern. It's not unexpected. I just thought I would ask and see if there was any help available. I, I, I guess I still don't understand what, what it is you're asking for. So. I'm probably asking for treatment like the rest of the fire board members is probably what I'm asking for to be able to come in and talk to people and, and whatnot. And the, the thing with Director DeMonico is he says, well, I've treated people badly and all that kind of stuff. Give me specifics. Give me specifics. All you do is say, well, you've treated people badly. We don't like you. We don't think anything of you. Well, also, you're the same people that said that if I asked for copies again, that I would be censured. I never asked for any copies, but I was censured. Um, you never said, well, if you treat people badly, you're gonna get censured, but you censured me. And y you guys are so inconsistent, and y you don't, y all you know you wanna do is hurt me, but you don't know why you want to hurt me, you don't give me specifics of why you want to hurt me, and you don't give me specifics of why you do hurt me. I don't understand it. And like you say, we're getting off subject. All I asked for was help on the computer. I said, I've been a good boy for 90 days. You said 30 days, Sarah. And you said, if, I, if I'm a good boy for 30 days, I've been a good boy for 90 days. Ask the chief if I've come in. If I've come here when I'm not supposed to, or anything else. And the last time I came in was at Mike's retirement. And I haven't been here since, except for these meetings. So are you going to make yourself a liar? Or are you going to be honest and say, well, really, we were thinking more of three years and three months. Because then you'll just be out of here. And is that what you want? I don't know what you want. I don't know what, what's going on. I can't make you love me. I can only ask you to do your job and give me the, the same treatment that the rest of you get. 
but you're not willing to do that. Chief, has Mr. Williams been in here at all? Yes, he has. On uh, July 1st, uh, he came in to sign an affidavit related to the public records request for Mr. Kyle Williams, uh, and that came about via an email exchange with Director Williams and I, uh, demanding staff support with that piece. He was unable to complete it electronically. I suggested a hard copy. Uh, he advised me that he did not have a printer available. Uh, I replied to him that we could provide him, and this is from memory, we could provide him uh, that hard copy. Uh, would he like to schedule an appointment? And that was a Friday. Uh, I did not hear back from Director Williams until Monday morning, uh, around 8 a.m. Uh, fortunately, I, I had prepared in advance. I was out of the office. Uh, one of my sons was having a medical procedure, and I was not in the office that morning. But I worked with Deputy Chief Atkinson and our Finance Director, Steve Heidi, uh, to be the point of contact. Around 8 a.m. that morning, Director Williams did re reply to my email and let me know that he would be in around, I believe it was 10 a.m. is the, the time that he advised me he would arrive. Uh, he did arrive and interacted uh, with the two gentlemen that I referenced, uh, and he was here for about 20 minutes uh, for completing a form that uh, involves checking the box and signing it, something that should be uh, no more than five minutes. Um, during that time, he inquired about uh, our finance director. It was off on medical leave. He asked some questions about that, and he also used it as an opportunity to ask staff and in, in, uh, inquire about some financial information uh, with former Chief Benson, uh, and uh, insinuating that uh, our finance director should have knowledge of this and what he believed were some improprieties with Chief Benson and the board at the time. So it, really the, the purpose of the visit was to complete the form uh, and leave that here. In addition, he was agitated with staff that he was not allowed uh, to go sit down at a desk or be allowed into other portions of the building. But the purpose of that meeting morphed into something else and it was an attempt to revisit historical issues that Director Williams has had with the district. And also, I believe at the last meeting, you came in and you asked the chief to make copies for you for your staff report. And then you turned around and you said it was a test that's not for my staff report. They were your personal copies that you tried to have made before. Um, that's coming up. I'm sorry? That's coming up. That's coming up. That's coming up. Okay, so you, you basically, you know, if that's coming up, we'll talk about it then. Okay, uh, is, uh, is there a motion? Seeing no motion, we'll move on to item 10. Item number 10, alleged battery. Purpose of, is for the Board of Directors to discuss the alleged battery of President DeMonaco by Director Williams and take action as deemed appropriate. Report by Fire Chief Tim Shackelford. President DeMonaco, members of the Board, good evening once again. During the board comment portion of the July 31st, 2019 special meeting, President DeMonica read a statement regarding the alleged battery that occurred at the July 10th, 2019 Board of Directors meeting. Included in the comment from President DeMonica was a request to place this item on the agenda for the August 14th, 2019 meeting. On August 4th, 2019, Vice President Luth and I received an, a very detailed email from Director Williams on this topic with a request to place the item on the August 14th, 2019 agenda for discussion in closed session. After conferring with legal counsel, it was determined that, dis that discussing the item in closed session would likely be considered a violation of the Brown Act. Therefore, the item was placed on the agenda for discussion in open session. On August 5th, 2019, I forwarded an email from legal counsel to Director Williams, which provided an explanation of why the item could not be discussed in closed session. It is recommended that the Board of Directors discuss the item and take ac action as deemed appropriate. Um, with that, I'm going to open this up for pu any public comment. Anybody from the public like to comment on this? Seeing none, I'm going to bring it back to the board for board comment. So, I would like to go first. Uh, I was going to read my comments from the last meeting again because I think it's important to know what occurred. And so I'm going to do that. But battery is an, uh, battery is an inten uh, intentional unpermitted act. <coughs> battery is the right to have one's body left alone by others. Battery is both a tort and a crime. Battery is harmful or offensive contact. The act of battery <coughs> is the same in both areas of the law. Touching the person of someone is defined as including not only contacts with the body, but also with anything closely connected with the body, such as clothing or an item carried in a person's hand. Battery includes contact that causes no actual physical harm, but it's instead offensive or insulting to the victim. This includes touching someone against his or her wills. 
The basic elements that establish battery are an act by a defendant, an intent to cause harmful or offensive contact on the part of the defendant, and harmful or offensive contact of the plaintiff. In tort law, the intent must be either specific intent, where the contact was specifically intended, or general intent, where the defendant was substantially certain that the act would cause contact. At a previous meeting, a former employee spoke of an instance where Mr. Williams tried to choke him over an incident of not providing him salt and pepper. Mr. Williams himself spoke, spoke of the time when he was employed where management personnel came out to his station to intervene with him because they feared he would go postal, his choice of words. Over the course of the past eight months or so, Mr. Williams has called me every name in the book and has talked to me very denigrating. He has been extremely nasty to me. At our last meeting, and that's the July meeting, Mr. Williams continued his verbal assaults towards me. After the meeting, Mr. Williams came up behind me, behind my back, and put his hands on me and slid his hands up towards my neck, which then I told him not to touch me. The act of sliding his hand towards my neck causes me great concern, especially after the report by a previous employee of the act com committed on him. This was not an act of friendship. This was an act that was intended to threaten, intimidate, or provoke me. His intentional act of battery upon me meets all aspects of the elements of battery. I have told Mr. Williams in the past not to put his hands on me or touch me in any manner. Mr. Williams, you have no right to place your hands on me, and I'm telling you right now, do not ever place your hands on me again in any manner. I have filed an incident report of your actions of the last meeting with the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department. I have not filed any charges at this time. I have not decided any direction I may take, including any criminal, civil, or both. Mr. Williams does not have the right to touch anyone without their permission. None of us have that right. Somehow he thinks his actions are okay. I would like to have this item placed on the August agenda for board discussion and action. And what I'm here to say is, is that everything you do is intentional. You snuck up behind me. You put your hands on me. Very, very intentional. I know you've done that to others at different times. And, and I think this board needs to address your whatever these things are that you do, your, your, your battery, your intent. And I think, and, and I'm, what I'm going to ask the board to do is to bring back a censure to tell you not to touch anybody else without their permission. Because I don't believe you, I don't believe anybody wants to have you come up behind their back and you put their hands on them and slide them up towards their neck. So with that, I'll open up to other comments. Um, I hope we're going to discuss this. If I ask for something, I hope you're not going to keep me from talking after that. Is there any way we can play the video? It is on video. Yes, it is. Me walking it. behind you. I've watched is, it. Is there any way we can bring that up? We don't have that capability in this room to bring that up. Uh, and I believe that was the re email request you sent to me for the last five or ten minutes of the meeting. And my reply to you, I did reference that it was available via link on our website. Yeah. Well, I, I just wondered if there was any way of bringing that up because I think that will explain, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. And I think the uh, video of what happened would show a lot. But there's no way of showing that in here. Is that correct? I don't believe so at this time. I think it would take a little work with our IT staff uh, to do that. So I don't, I don't think we'd be capable of doing that on short notice. Would we be able to bring it up at the next meeting? I think it's important. I mean, you're making some, some pretty strong accusations there. And it is on video, and there's no reason not to put it on there. Put a battery on me. I've told you before, don't touch me. Keep your hands off of me. You did not tell me before that period of time, and nowhere in the record does and it show why, you. And why, after calling me all those names, would you feel it's appropriate to come up and put your hands on me? Um, you know, you guys make a lot of statements. Uh, uh, statements about me allegedly causing the need for the equipment out there for the... Uh, metal detectors and all that kind of stuff. I have never exploded the way you exploded when I walked up behind you. And it's very important to hear my comment because you can hear it when I touched you. Keep your hands away from me. And okay, you've made that clear. I'm not gonna touch you anymore, okay? But it is on video and it should be played and it should be played with my comment because I made a comment 
are we ever going to be able to resolve this? And I, I'm going to have to say, under the circumstances, it probably, with your attitude, it's not going to happen. Uh, what, I, what I actually feel, John, is you are embarrassed because you acted unilaterally and you got caught acting unilaterally. And what, With what? what was in you? regard to going after me because of the two copies that I requested from the clerk of the board, I know you're shaking your head no, but there's no other reason for you to act the way you've acted. And <clears throat> the thing that I'd like to state here is you're going after me because of these two copies. And when I said about the copies that I asked from the chief, um, I'm going to try and make an appointment with the chief and I'm going to make a presentation at the next meeting in regards to these two copies. I think, I think everybody should see the two copies and see what it's all about and understand that the two copies were not personal. And that's very important to me because my feeling is, is the clerk of the board wanted to cause a lot of trouble, and she has. And I, I can't help but feel there's a lot of emails going on or in, information. Please, 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 now, please, let, please, let, please, let, please, let me... Please, please, talk in generalities, please. I did. I didn't say any names. So my we feeling only is... We have one clerk of the board, so I guess I'm confused I'm sorry about, about that. Yeah. Sometimes that's the way it goes. But there's a lot of emails going on between her and our former chief, Benson, in regards to all the trouble you that know, she's do caused. Not make and I hope she's happy about it. against staff. That's, that's not fair to make accusations like and, that, and, that. You don't know. And it's not any fair for you guys to do Let's, what you're doing to me. We need to, I think we need to bring it back to the... Uh, agenda. I and the other thing is, and you're coming up next here, Jeff, is I am a member of the board, and you as the uh, counsel for the board and for the district should not be putting pitting one board member against another. Okay, let's... Let's no. Get, let's get back to the issue at hand. No. This is the battery. issue. That is not the issue. Let's get back to the battery. If you want to talk about that in your comments, talk about that in your comments. So let's go back to the, 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 the battery. <clears throat> let's resolve this. It was not a battery. Uh, and, right. and we won't be able to resolve this until we see it on the video. Can I, can I, to the law, I can, get to determine can, can, can I have a couple minutes here? A um, couple things. I, I think it's been made very clear uh, to Mr. Williams that he shouldn't and can't be touching anybody here at the district. You got that, right? I got it. Okay. So, so I think that's one thing. The second thing is, is, is I want to, I want to make sure we're being careful on what could be a civil issue versus what is a board issue. Um, so I, I I, I want to figure out where that is, but also, correct me if I'm wrong, but we have a active and current investigation ongoing into Ms. Williams' behavior. Is that is that correct? Yes. So, could this just be folded into that as well, is my, my question. Do we need to... If, if that's the board's direction, you might want to bring that back at a, at a separate item. Yeah. Okay. I, I, that, I'm, just, I'm just asking here how, how this is best handled. So I, I, I don't know is my answer. So that's, that's kind of my direction. John, what? And my, and my concern is this puts the district in a position that we have to address this. When he puts his hands on other people, if we as a board don't address that, and uh, if we don't address it, I don't know if we can consider it an act of omission or not, but I don't want to see where it would put the district at risk for anything by the board not taking action on that. You're nuts. That's all I can tell you. You know, you, call, you say I've called you. Don't do stupid things if you don't want to be called stupid. That's, that's the thing. Right back at you. And the thing is, is until and until such time as we get it on the video and we look at it and we hear what I said, John, all you do is you take what people say 
you took what the clerk of the board said. Oh, well, he asked me for these copies. Name and names again. And yeah, you, off topic. and Frank Sexton stood up there and made a comment. And you immediately grasp on it, whether it's true or not. You don't care. You don't care. You didn't let me, you didn't do any, do, yeah, see, here we got a guy shaking his head because he, there was no due process on any of this. If anybody says anything negative on me, you immediately grasp on it and you take it as gospel truth. And the thing is, is I, I, I made the statement that those guys came out there. And you know what? They left. They left me in charge of the station that I was the captain at, and they left. If there had been anything to what they thought, they would have immediately pulled me off the floor, and they would have had me go for psych. And, but they didn't. I, I stayed at the station, so they knew that there was nothing to what they said. But you won't take that. See, you want, you want to take only the negative against me. I'm used to it, but go ahead and do it. Frank Sexton said that he choked me out. Well, I didn't choke him out. If I choked him out, why didn't he do something about it at the time it happened? Why does he come back 30 years later and say, he choked me out? And all of that kind of stuff. That, that's the thing you have to look at. Just like these two copies. I am going to talk about the two copies at the next meeting. We're going to look at them, and you're going to see that they were not personal. But she said they were personal. Oh, well, they're personal. So I'm going to make a big issue out of it. I'm going to uh, threaten him. I'm going to do all this other stuff. So I can do nothing right here. As far as you're concerned, I can do nothing right. What did you want me to do on those two copies? Did you want me to grovel? Oh, please, Mr. <laughs> President, please don't do anything. No, tell me what you wanted me to do. On I want to know what you want. And I'd like to hear from the other board members. I'm asking what you guys want. What do you want of me? Just tell me what you want. Maybe I can do it. May I have a turn to speak? Yes, Vice President Luke. Thank you. Um, General, I, I appreciate your concern, and I'm concerned as well. I, I, I'm... <clears throat> very uncomfortable with the idea of another censure over this at this point, unless there really is some potential liability to the district, and that it would look to legal counsel for any guidance on that. But I believe you've put Director Williams on notice. It's been publicly, you've read your statement now twice. Um, uh, you've filed a report. Um, and yeah, while it happened here in a board room, in a board meeting, post-board meeting, I just struggle with the idea of, uh, of a censure over this unless there really is some liability or some concern to the district that um, legal counsel could weigh in on or if uh, we need to look into that a little further. Um, obviously, uh, President DeMonico has expressed his concern over uh, what he believes is the alleged battery. Um, I think he's made it clear to Board Member Williams he doesn't want to be touched again. I think Board Member Williams has acknowledged that. I think if it were an ongoing matter, that might expose the district to liability. Um, I think one incident uh, would be uh, pretty pretty tough to establish liability on the part of the district, especially given the attention that we've we've provided to the to the matter at this point. All right. So that would end my comments. Thank you. Okay. So um, I'm going to have to agree with um, Vice President Luth this evening. He's been put on notice, and, and, and typically in these scenarios, we have to accept, you know, we have to take the complaint. We put the person on notice, so to speak, and he's been placed on notice publicly um, <clears throat> not to touch people. And if I see further incidents as this, I will definitely... Um, you know, bring it back to the board and, and for discussion. I think right now a censure is a little too soon in the game as well. Um, I don't have to be told not to touch people. I, I know when people don't like me and when, you know, you keep your space and that. Um, 
I would hope that you, Director Williams, understand, you know, when you're having a conflict with somebody, like you, you did, I guess, in that, in that meeting, um, you don't go up behind them. It's not appropriate to go up behind them and, and touch someone. So just don't be touching people. That's all I'm going to ask. That's all. I, so I have I, no motion. I agree. All I would ask is that you guys watch the video, listen to my comment, and we'll go from there. Because the comment was, is are we going to be able to resolve this? Are we going to go three years and th four months or whatever I have left on this type of a situation because you guys want to act this way? What is it going to take to resolve it? Well, we're going to move on on the uh, agenda item. And uh, seeing no motion, we'll move on to item 11. Item number 11, incident response time information. Purpose is for the board of directors to receive information about incident response times. Report by Fire Chief Tim Shackelford. President DeMonico, members of the board, good evening once again. On August 4th, 2019, I received an email from Director Williams with a request to provide an update on the reporting of number of calls and response times. Uh, earlier this year, the district transitioned to CONFIRE for dispatch services. During that transition of dispatch providers, the Board of Directors were advised that there would be a temporary impact on the reporting of incident response information. Contained within the agenda packet this evening is the incident response data from our dispatch transition date of March 11, 2019 through June 30th, 2019. Uh, it's recommended that the Board of Directors receive and file the information in the report. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have about that data. I'd like to open this up for public comment. Anybody from the public like to comment on our response data? Seeing that, we'll bring it back. Oh, board. no, nope. we had Charlie. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Charlie. I didn't see your hand. Basically, what you're saying, Chief, is, is that the uh, response. Come to the podium, the please. <laughs> 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 I hate Robert's rules of order. <laughs> right. I'll make it quick. Basically, what you're saying is, is that because you trans transition to a new system, the response times, you know, became a little less than you'd like them to be. Once the re once you effectively transitioned, then they went back to what they normally are. Uh, let, let me attempt to, to clarify that, um, sort of, and I know that's not a good answer. Uh, the, the intent was we transitioned dispatch service providers. Uh, the data is usually a couple months behind that we'd report to the board. But we knew with the transition there would be a gap in that period, so that's why we had stopped reporting that information to the board. The new information is in a different format, and we've worked through that piece. Uh, the board's been provided that data inside the packet. It's the average response time. It's a little. The reports are slightly different than they were before, uh, but we are tracking the response times. There's not been a significant change in response times. So it's, it's uh, reported that basis. There's a, we have the ability going forward to do a lot more with that data. We can really drill down further. But this is essentially getting the board caught up on the months that we're missing uh, from that transitional period through the end of June. Right. Well, basically, you know, you've transitioned to the new system, correct? Yes, sir. And basically, the response time is as good or better than it was before. Yes. That's all I want to know. Do we have any other public comment? Questions? Seeing now, I'll bring it back to the board for board comments. Thank you for the information, Chief. Yeah, I would agree. It's good to have that information available again, and I know we continue to look at what's available, what information can be reported, but uh, yes, thank you. Are we all caught up now with all the uh, back months that we didn't have? Um, the response times and everything, is that correct? I believe so. Uh, I'm, I'm not certain that uh, some of the data between January 1st and March 11th has been reported. There may be some issues, uh, and this is, remember, I think there was a, a portion of one month that we were having difficulty getting the data from our previous provider. I do have some basic information, it's just the total call numbers. Uh, and so that, that portion that's missing, and I'd have to reference previous board agenda packets to determine that appropriately. Uh, from January 1st through March 11th, the transition time, uh, 2,397 calls were dispatched through Ontario. And then since uh, the transition, including that number, so January 1st through June 30th, uh, 6,205 calls total. 
And we have all the information as far as response times and everything for all those. I believe, so everything since the transition is included in this packet. I believe most, if not all of the months, had been previously reported, but there may be um, some period in there. I know that at some point in, uh, right before the transitional period, we're having issues getting some of the data from Ontario, and I don't know that that was specifically ever reported. If it was not, it was a very brief time period. Now, did they give you a, a reason why this information was not being uh, given to us in a timely manner, or did they ever give you a good good reason why they're having trouble with it? Uh, there, there's some transition with personnel uh, at the dispatch, uh, but also had to do with the CAD feed and some of the uh, services that happened with the transfer. Uh, and without, and I don't want to get too technical here, uh, and it's really outside my scope of expertise anyway. There's a lot with the 911 routing portion with the providers, so there's a lot of transitional time frames and a lot of planning on the front end, and I'm not certain that the data was readily available uh, in the format that they would normally provide it to us. So we would get a PDF from them, but it was an output from CAD, uh, and it was a um, combination of the call processing time um, the response time from our personnel, including turnout time and everything else, from the uh, inception of the call, the answer at the public safety answering point, to when our personnel got on scene. The new uh, system that we have in place will give us far greater data, and I, uh, at some point, would like to bring uh, requests back to the board to potentially consider an ad hoc uh, to work with staff to provide a little more direction of what the board would like to see in those reports, and, and again, um, I, on the staff side, we're gonna look to move to report more of this in real time uh, via our website uh, with average response times, uh, call data, uh, incident types, things like that. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, uh, does not require a motion, that'll be a receive and file. And fire Chief's comments. President DeMonico, members of the board, I'm certain by now you're getting tired of hearing me speak, so I will try to keep this as brief as possible. Under personnel development activities, EMS Nurse Parham, uh, Captain Kripe, and our senior IT analyst Roberts attended an image trend conference in Minnesota on July 1st, uh, excuse me, July 23rd through 26th. Under board activities, public relations, on July 24th, several of the chief officers and I attended a celebration of life service for retired Ontario Fire Chief Rob Elwell. Uh, in addition, the district provided an engine company, a battalion chief, for a few hours on the day of the service so Ontario fire personnel could attend. On July 25th, several chief officers, Vice President Luth and I, attended the Walk of Honor Retirement Ceremony for Chino Police Chief Comstock. On July 31st, Firefighter Paramedic Art Organista retired after 28 years of service with the district. On August 1st, several chief officers, Vice President Luth and I, attended the swearing-in ceremony of new Chino Police Chief Simmons. The fire district participated in the annual National Night Out event, which took place on August 6th. And I'd like to also thank our staff for their engagement in that. We had a number of events to attend to, and, and it really was all hands on deck for that evening. On August 7th, Battalion Chief Williams and I attended the Carbon Canyon Fire Safe Council meeting and addressed concerns related to the Star Fire. Uh, Deputy Fire Marshal Ott does an outstanding job as a liaison to that group. He's also an excellent resource as he oversees our weed abatement program. Uh, August 8th, the district hosted an after-action review with partner agencies that provided assistance during the Star Fire. Upcoming events, the ASB CSD monthly meeting will take place on August 19th at Najwa's Mediterranean Cuisine in Loma Linda. The Finance Committee, uh, Finance Committee meeting is scheduled for August 19th at 4.30 p.m. at administration. On September 11th, the district will host a 9-11 Remembrance event at Fire Station 66. Additional information will be provided once the event details have been finalized. The 2019 State of the City Community Fair celebration uh, for Chino Hills, uh, and that's with Mayor Cynthia Moran, will take place at the Chino Hills Community Center on Saturday, September 21st, from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. And the CSD Annual Conference will take place September 25th through the 28th in Anaheim. And again, we'll be able to touch on both those uh, uh, events at the next meeting as they fall after the September meeting. That concludes my comments for this evening. Board committee reports and board comments. Mr. Williams. I'd like to go last, please. Actually, I, I go last because I closed the meeting. Can I go next to last? Sure. Director Evans here. Okay. All right. So, um, once again, I want to thank 
the chief and um, for the report this evening and um, everyone involved for our entire district and everyone who helped out. Um, I want to thank and congratulate um, Finance Director Heidi. Thank you so much for bringing this district up to where we are with our um, with the award. I mean, when when I was listening to her, you know, say uh, the high standards, the transparency, how you've really brought us to this prestigious level. I just want to thank you, and um, it's. It's awesome to be the first to always receive these things. We've been first in a lot of areas. We've worked very, very hard. And I just, I know it wasn't just you. You're going to say that very humble, hum humbly, but um, I want to thank you, your staff, everyone who was involved in that. And I really appreciate the efforts that you've um, done to bring us forward on this. Um, our service awards, Chaplain Lewis, um, he's amazing. He always goes out of his way to make me feel very special because um, I'm the only gal on the board, so he's, he's just an amazing individual, and I agree um, with your comment, President DeMonico, that this man, or, or actually the chief, this man has some amazing stories. Um, Engineer Colonna, uh, on his 15 years, it's great. We have, I love fact that we have so many people that are here for so many service years. And um, I attended um, Chino Council meeting on July 16th, um, the retirement of Chief Comstock. And, and one of the things that I communicated to her is my appreciation for being such a partner to the district. Um, the, we have such a great relationship with, the, uh, with both PDs, but it's been great, and I'm sure Captain S Simmons, congratulations, or Chief Simmons, congratulations, will continue that. Um, I also, let me see here, um, attended, well, our special board meeting, and then um, attended the IAFF um, annual conference. It was extremely educational, and as President DeMonico um, stated earlier, that we did receive a, um, got an overview of the um, Paradise Fire Chief David Hawks, and that was um, that was very enlightening to hear about that. Uh, I want to thank everyone for participating in the Relay for Life. I personally wasn't able to do it, and I think staff. Are, there's a lot of requests that come through from the district of staff, and um, I know it gets very taxing. And I just want to thank everybody for continuing to support the community and all the requests that we receive. I. I, I we go above and beyond in trying to help. And so I just want to thank you for that. And um, I just, this evening, just, you know, our prayers for the um, officers that were um, shot today. And I know that they weren't life-threatening, but just our prayers for everybody. And then we also had a 15-year-old this um, evening who um, was struck by a vehicle. And just um, our prayers for that young individual as um, they're being treated. And I think that I'm looking, I think that's all my comments right now. Thank you. Thank you, President DeMonico. Um, uh, I was not supposed to be in town for Relay for Life, and I was at the last minute, so I went at like 1 o'clock in the afternoon. It was wonderfully hot. Oh. Uh, I, I did a couple laps, and then I, uh, I called it a day. But uh, great event. Um, I wish I was able to commit more to that because that's a wonderful thing. Um, attend this, the Chino Hills Council meeting last night. Harvey, I'm going to steal your thunder here. Okay. Uh, they introduced the new, I'm sorry, Ben Montgomery, our city manager here in Chino Hills, who's our esteemed guest here tonight. Um, he uh, introduced the new assistant manager, Rod Hill, uh, who came from the uh, city of Whittier and a new public works director, Daniel Bodadilla, uh, who came from Azusa. So it was nice to meet uh, two of the new leaders uh, in the city. Um, uh, county supervisors meetings, um, nothing really impactful on that outside of that I got reappointed to the, uh, the county um, parks um, commission. Um, I do that outside of this, has something to do with the fire board. But at that meeting today, we were talking about uh, the general plan for Prado Park, or the master plan for Prado Park that's being redone right now, and uh, some things that are, could have some significant impacts 
on local resources, including the fire district. So the chief and I spoke about that, and I'll be speaking with Supervisor Hagman about my thoughts on that. Uh, school board uh, was at the last meeting, but the next meeting is uh, tomorrow night, and that's going to be a fun one. Uh, they're updating their sexual education um, manual, so there'll be a lot of people with inputs on that. Um, I met with the chief, of course, uh, for a monthly meeting. Um, uh, congratulations to Don and the rest of the finance team for receiving that wonderful award. Uh, and, and and you too, Steve, for receiving that. Uh, but no, seriously, we're we're very proud that you guys have uh, have worked so hard to 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 really just showcase how how well you guys run the department, and and we really appreciate that uh, uh, very much. So thank you for that. Um, all the member service awards that we gave out tonight is fantastic. It's just seeing seeing the people get get all that. Uh, my last comment is just kind of a general one that, you know, I've, I've said in the past, people have heard me say that our job is to, is to be focused on financial o oversight and policy direction. And I feel in the last several months, we're getting bogged down by stuff that has nothing to do with financial oversight or policy direction for the future and moving forward with the district. And I, I, I hope we can get back to that uh, and not have the past be brought up every meeting. Um, I, I just, uh, it's disheartening. And I think that we need to be helping to drive the district forward and not backwards. And with that, I'll leave that with my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Thank you. As the chief mentioned, was that uh, Chief Comstock's walk of, of honor. They do that so well. It's the uh, swearing in of Chief Simmons. Uh, on the third, it was at the Relay for Life. Earlier in the morning, it was hot then, too. The <laughs> district had a great turn, uh, great presence there. It was awesome. Uh, last night, as you mentioned, the Chino Hills City Council. Um, thank you for the information on the Starfire response. It is, th there's a lot that goes on in such a short period of time and to, to see that and understand the timelines, uh, to hear about the response of our people, uh, people coming from off duty, just incredible. And then, of course, all the, res all the response and support we receive from other agencies. So I appreciate that, uh, just, just a tremendous effort on everyone's part. Congratulations to, to Steve, yeah, you and your staff uh, just what a wonderful job. You do a great job of, of keeping us financially straight, reporting, uh, keeping things very transparent. Um, well deserved. Thank you very much for your good, hard efforts on that. Congratulations to all our service awards winners. Um, and Robert Lewis, yeah, his voice is so soothing and so, uh, his cadence, his voice, his mannerisms. And you're right, he's a very interesting man. I've, I've talked to him a few times, and there's just some things that I would love to learn more about that, that he's been involved with. It's incredible. Uh, my last comment would just be, it just, it, it just keeps paining me to hear uh, one of our directors continuing to disparage and make accusational comments against specific district staff. I, I, just, I just don't understand it. it it's an things from the past, real or imagined, I, I don't know, but I, I just don't understand it. Uh, I'm concerned with um, violations of board policy related to that. I need to dig into that a little bit more, but I, I just, I just want to let staff know I am, I'm, it bothers me and I'm concerned. And that would end my comments. Mr. Williams. Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk. Um, as you guys have stated, I'm concerned too about the way things have gone. But I'm the guy that's on the bottom end, and I'm I'm catching all the, the drippings here, and they're not good. And uh, I'd like to have them end. Um, I do. I'm asking for the opportunity at the next meeting to make a comment again, bring it up, because what's happened to me wasn't deserved. And 
it transitioned into what it became because of two copies. And, and the comments that I make here, I make because I have a right to speak my mind, the same as everybody else here. And you may not like what I say, but by the same token, I have a right to speak. And I don't like to talk about individuals. I don't like to talk about the clerk of the board and the stuff like that. But things have gone on. And people deserve it. You said you want, a trend, you want it open. Let's make it open. Let's make it real. And see, you give me this look like, I'm not going to grovel. I'm not going to let somebody like your director, Monaco, the Monaco, do things like he did to me without coming to me and talking to me. Saying, when we've got a report here of something going on. But no, he didn't do that. He, he just immediately sent me a threatening letter. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to get you. We're going to do this. What the heck kind of a way is that to be? He didn't even know for sure that I did it, but every time something about me comes up, I'm immediately wrong. I'm the guy that did it. I choked the guy out. They came and they wanted to see if I was going to go postal. And he wants to make an issue out of this stuff. And I have to say, no, they left. They left me there in charge of the station. They knew that there was no... I was honest enough to bring it out, and now he wants to use it against me. There was nothing to it. And 30 years later or whatever, I've been off the, off the department since 2000, and the guy comes out and says, he choked me out. And here's Director DeMonico. Well, he choked a guy out. Come on. Give me a break. Where, where does it end? If, if anybody says anything negative about me, it's immediately true. It's got to be true. Now, as far as this investigation on me, I'm coming out lily white. Just wait till it comes out, because there's nothing that you're going to find on me that has any, any significance at all in regards to what you're looking for. It's not there. And that's, that's my statement, and that's exactly what you're going to find. And um, as far as our council, <clears throat> I do intend to go to the bar. I just want you to know that because as... Are you threatening litigation? As a member... Litigation, the bar is not litigation, Mr. DeMonico. The bar is not litigation. Okay, I just want to make sure that we're not getting off track there. And All right, but the, but the thing is, is I'm a member of the council, and for you to pit council members or one council member against another and stuff like that, I'm talking, please, you're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. That's the worst thing that, a, one of the worst things that a lawyer can do is turn on, on his client. We're all clients here. And we're all part of the fire district. The fire district is your, is, is your uh, client. And we're all part of that. And for you to start pitting one board member against another is not the way things be, should be done. If you wanted to do that, you should have told these guys, well, you'll have to get other counsel because I can't do that. And you are wrong. You are dead wrong. And we'll find out. Because what you're doing here, you don't, you don't start that because you represent every one of us as board members and you represent us as the district. And you can shake your head and all that all you want, but it's a fact. And we'll, we'll see where it ends up. And I'm sorry you did that because you've caused me a lot of trouble. You've really caused me a great deal of trouble by that nasty letter that you wrote threatening all kinds of litigation and everything over two lousy copies. 
and now you got them censuring me and everything else. It's not you doing it, but you've caused it. Because I'm a bad guy because I didn't like the idea of all the nasty things you wrote over two lousy letters. And, and it's unfortunate. But at this time, I am asking that I will work with the chief and I will get the letters on the board and we're going to talk about them. And I'm going to show you why I had a right to those letters. And I would think that a, a person in the position of our um, clerk of the board making almost $250,000 a year with benefits would know what she can do and what she can't do. But I don't think that's the case here. And it's, it's unfortunate. And here I am getting this stuff and everything. Why don't you guys try and act decent? Why don't you tell me what you want? Why don't you say, well, when? Why don't you just do this? I think we've already done that one. And, and when we've also you asked you not to, to, ask, not to, to bring employees up, and, and that's just inappropriate. When move forward. That's what we've asked it's you no do. more inappropriate than you mm -hmm. talk, saying what a great job they're doing. Because if they're doing a lousy job, I have a right to, to, to say that. We don't, we don't do their performance. Or, or pre I still have a right, my yeah, opinion. No. President DeMonico, just, just, I, I think we need to kind of limit the, the discussion. It's the same old rhetoric, we get this every meeting. Just and we because need to you have the right to say something doesn't we're gonna we should. Okay. We're going to move on. Well, that's it. Uh, I just want you to know where I'm at. We're moving on. Just because you don't like it doesn't mean it shouldn't Same be done. rhetoric, Mr. Williams, please. We're moving on. I haven't heard you say anything nice about the awards or anything else, but I'm going to do that. And, uh, and Steve, I think you and your staff did a great job. Congratulations on the award. I think that really puts our district uh, in the forefront of, of, of special districts. And, and thank you so much for that. For uh, Chaplain Lewis, he's a wonderful man and just incredible, and I hope we do keep him for a long time. For the uh, personnel that received their service awards, and you two out there, Jeff. <laughs> we saw you sneak in, Jeff. We know you got 25 years. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, Jeff and Pete and um, uh, Engineer Kalina. But anyhow, congratulations to all you guys, and thank you for that. The Starfire, you know, that, that was a, uh, a fire that could have gone any number of ways. And uh, Sarah and I, we sat in a, a, an overview of the campfire, the Paradise Fire, at the uh, Fire Rescue International, and, and got an overview. And the reality is, is that this fire we had was 156 acres. It could have exploded into something much more devastating than that. And I think doing the right things at the right time and, uh, you know, putting the resources where we need them, I think that, that, that had a dramatic effect on being able to stop that fire where it was stopped. But the potential, uh, I have no idea what the potential is. I mean, it's just incredible what it could be, and, and thank you for that. Um, with that, I'm going to conclude my comments, and we're going to adjourn to closed session. President Bonico, before you read that, can I just get some clarity? I believe there was a request from Director Williams to agendize a topic. I want to confirm that, and then also ask him to provide me those documents if that was a can legitimate I make a, request. Can I make a, a suggestion is to have Mr. Williams email you all that information and, uh, and sort it out to find what's appropriate in district business? Can I meet with you? And, I'd uh, prefer to meet with you. Thank me, you. Excuse me, I'm talking, please. Uh, please email with Mr. Williams to uh, find out what it is he's looking for and what he wants to do. And if it's district business, then to uh, proceed in that fashion and, and uh, take care of it via email. Uh, with that, we'll set suffice, Chief? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're going to adjourn to closed session. Uh, closed session, conference with legal counsel on anticipated litigation, significant exposure to litigation pursuant to paragraph 2 of subdivision D of section 54956.9, one potential case. Threat of litigation dated May 31st, 2018 from David Mistagny, attorney at law representing Chino Valley Professional Firefighters, Local 3522. Conference with real property negotiators pursuant to government code section 54956.8. The board of directors will meet with its designated negotiators. Fire team, 
Uh, actually, this is because we're not the we solve the ad hoc, so it's not the ad hoc. So we'll just be meeting with Fire Chief Tim Shackelford, and uh, regarding real property owned by the City of Chino Hills and located on an undeveloped parcel located on the south side of Soco Canyon at the intersection of Soco Canyon and Pipeline Avenue, the Board of Directors will instruct the district negotiators concerning the price and terms of payment. So with that, we'll go ahead and adjourn to closed session. I want to say thank you to everybody for coming out tonight. Reopen open session, and we have no reportable action out of closed session. This meeting will adjourn to a regular meeting of the Board of Directors of the Chino Valley Independent Fire District to be held on Wednesday, September 11, 2019 at 6 p.m. at District Headquarters Office located at 14011 City Center Drive, Chino Hills, California. Meeting adjourned. So we're going to have a meeting on 9-11.